and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Justice Committee for this year. We have no apologies this morning. Um, agenda item one is uh, stage one consideration of the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill. Um, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, uh, Hamza Youssef, uh, and various of his officials to the meeting. Some are joining us here in the room and some are joining us remotely uh, online. You're all uh, very welcome. Um, uh, can I just explain before we get underway that it's very unusual at the beginning of a stage one inquiry to start with evidence from the responsible minister, the cabinet secretary, and normally we take evidence from the responsible minister at the end, and in this inquiry we will do that. Um, but uh, uh, the cabinet secretary indicated to parliament uh, um, uh, earlier in the autumn that he wished uh, to propose amendments to aspects of this bill at stage two. Um, and the committee wanted to understand exactly what the implications of those amendments are before we get underway with our uh, stage one uh, um, evidence taking from uh, external stakeholders. And that is the reason why uh, the Cabinet Secretary is appearing at the beginning and at the end of this inquiry. I don't know, Cabinet Secretary, if you want to make any opening remarks before we get underway, but if you don't, then do, do, would, would, would you? So just some brief opening remarks, if I may. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Thank you for the committee. To, for being so accommodating, as you say, unusual for a cabinet secretary or minister to attend at this stage. Uh, but I do thank the committee for being uh, accommodating and allowing me to give evidence in the hate crime uh, and public order uh, Scotland bill. Um, I will talk about the amendments uh, that I announced, or the proposed amendments that I announced to Parliament uh, on the 23rd of September. However, just worth giving the briefest of overviews on the purpose of the bill uh, and, and its background. Effective hate crime legislation makes it very clear to victims, to perpetrators and wider society, that offences that are motivated by prejudice uh, are completely unacceptable and will be treated seriously. Uh, I'm committed to taking this opportunity to shape legislation so that it is fit for the 21st century, and most importantly, affords pr sufficient protections to those that need it, but at the same time uh, continues to give people reassurance around their important freedoms of expression. Uh, legislation on hate crime has evolved over time in quite a fragmented manner. It's not as user-friendly as it could or indeed should be. This bill provides for the modernising, the consolidation and indeed uh, extending of hate crime legislation in Scotland and is very much based on the independent review uh, by Lord Brackadale and further consultation following his recommendations. Um, in short, the bill seeks to modernise and extend hate crime uh, legislation by including age as an additional characteristic, uh, creating new offences relating to stirring up of hatred that will apply in relation to each of its characteristics, uh, updating the definition of transgender identity, including removing the term uh, intersexuality and creating a separate category for variation in sex characteristics, and by including a power to enable characteristic of sex to be added to the list of characteristics at a later date, uh, for example, if that is recommended by the working group and misogynistic uh, harassment. In relation to that group that I've just mentioned, uh, this will be established to consider how the justice system currently deals with misogyny. Uh, the group will specifically consider whether a standalone offence to tackle misogynistic behaviour is required within our criminal law and whether the characteristic of sex is required within the hate crime legislative framework. Uh, the appointment of the working group's chair will reflect the expertise that these important issues demand and will ensure that gender equality, human rights are in course uh, and, of course, the law are given equal weighting. Uh, a participative approach will be integral to this work, and I'm committed to ensuring that membership of the working group reflects a wide breadth of opinion, diversity, knowledge and experience, uh, reflecting the complexity of the issue at hand. Uh, appointment arrangements uh, for a chair are currently in train, and I will update Parliament on this and the group's terms of reference very shortly. In relation to the amendments that I proposed on the 23rd of September, um, in announcing that change, uh, I, I, I do not propose adjustments to the threshold for the stunning up of offences for racial hatred, which have been part of our criminal law. In the law of the whole of the UK for decades in the form provided for uh, in the bill, the proposed change to the operation of the new stunning up offences was not a decision that was arrived at lightly. Uh, I listened and discussed with uh, a number of stakeholders and indeed politicians and, and, and political parties with the aim of seeking to strike a more appropriate balance between respecting freedoms of expression while protecting those impacted by people who deliberately set out to stir up hatred. I'm pleased that a broad range of organisations, including the Faculty of Advocate, Law Society of Scotland, Humanist Society of Scotland and the Catholic Church, have welcomed uh, the change uh, which is uh, to, uh, for the new stirring up of offences uh, to be intent uh, only and to remove the likely limb 
uh, from that uh, offence. This change also affects consideration of other ancillary issues, such as the operation of the reasonable defence and, indeed, areas of the freedom of expression. These provisions were included in the Bill in the context of offences that could be committed where hatred is likely to be stirred up. So I'll engage with Parliament and stakeholders uh, as the Bill undergoes the scrutiny process to consider whether it will benefit from further changes. Uh, and to conclude, uh, Convener, I want to reassure members that I will seek uh, common ground, consensus and, where necessary, compromise. Since the Bill was introduced, I have met with over 50 organisations from a broad range of sectors to discuss its implications. It is, of course, for this Parliament uh, and primarily for this uh, committee to scrutinise the Bill and decide exactly where the appropriate balance lies between effectively tackling hate crime to protect those targeted by its uh, insidious effects, uh, but while also protecting people's legitimate right to freedom of expression. I do believe the two are not uh, mutually exclusive, so I'm happy to take questions. Uh, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I want to start just where you left off there with your um, understanding of how Parliament, how you think, as a responsible minister for this bill, that Parliament should seek to legislate in an area touching on the fundamental human right, the freedom of expression. And would you, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but would you agree or disagree with the proposition that rights such as freedom of speech should be interpreted and applied generously and that restrictions um, to the exercise of those rights should be legislated for narrowly and only where shown to be necessary in the public interest? I agree broadly uh, with the statement uh, that you make, Convener. It's important to, to remember, and I know you're very aware of this, and I'm certain members of the committee are very aware of this, that any bill that we pass, of course, will look to be compatible with ECHR. The importance uh, of uh, a variety of ECH articles, but particularly, of course, the article around freedom uh, of expression, that is vitally important. But I agree with your general premise. Um, so that's why decisions taken on this are, are, are not taken lightly. And that's why the changes that I proposed on the 23rd of September, I think, uh, get that balance just about right. So where there is um, reasonable doubt about whether the balance has been appropriately struck or inappropriately struck, not just with regard to this bill, but with regard to any bill that touches on fundamental human rights, such as free speech, the, uh, the, what Parliament should do then uh, is to err on the side of giving protection to the right rather than uh, curtailing the right, because the right should be interpreted generously and the restriction on the right should be, um, should be applied only where it is necessary. Remember also that people have the right, and I speak as somebody who has been often the target and the victim of hatred, be it racial or religious, that people have the right to live their life without having that prejudice, that hatred uh, directed towards them. The criminal law must protect people from that hatred. I think most of us will agree, for all the disagreements that we have around this bill, most will agree with the principle that hate crime legislation is required. Um, and, and therefore, uh, in my opinion, you must balance rights. You must balance the right of people to have freedom of speech, but at the same time, we must balance that with the right for people who are often the targets of hatred to be protected from that hatred as a society and as a parliament. We have to get that balance right. I do not think the two are mutually exclusive. Uh, I think we can make sure we get the balance right for, for both. Um. I, I absolutely agree that the two are not mutually exclusive, but it doesn't follow from that that getting the balance right between them is uh, easy, and you're not, of course, implying that it is easy. Can I just ask you what the government's view is and what your view is about how far the right to freedom of speech extends? You mentioned in your opening remarks, Cabinet Secretary, both the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society of Scotland. The Law Society of Scotland uh, cites with approval in its evidence the well-known dictum from Lord Justice Sedley um, that the right, to freedom of exp uh, the right to freedom to speak only inoffensively is not worth having. And the Faculty of Advocates cites in its evidence the equally well-known dictum from Lord Roger um, where he said uh, that freedom of speech applies to information or ideas that offend, shock and disturb. Do you accept that the right to freedom of speech in European human rights law um, extends to the right to offend? Yes, uh, and that's why the bill, there's not a, a word in the bill that deals with offence. People should have the right to be offensive. Uh, people should have the right uh, to, to express views that are controversial. This bill does not intend to deal with uh, people who have offensive views. What the stirring up offences, for example, which are the most controversial part, 
of the bill seek to do is to criminalise behaviour that is either threatening or abusive, or uh, ha and sorry, also has the intention of stirring up hatred. And that is for the new offences. Of course, the racial stirring up offence. I have to be clear about that. Continues to have the threshold. It, it, it continues to, to, to ha uh, has had for the last 34 years. But for the new offences, the behaviour must be threatening or abusive with the intent of stirring up hatred. Uh, so that does not deal with, with, with offence. So uh, what was also helpful to, to, to note is, since the announcement I made on the 23rd of September, uh, the, the, the bodies that you quote uh, have supported that change or proposed change. The Faculty of Advocates say the Scottish Government has listened to concerns over freedom of expression, which, cover, which was voiced by many others, uh, and proposes to amend the bill so that a crime will be committed only with a stirring up uh, of hatred is intentional. The faculty welcomes that announcement. The Law Society says uh, we are pleased that the Cabinet Secretary uh, is actively seeking common ground and compromise to ensure Scots law is fit for the 21st century and there are sufficient protections for the most vulnerable uh, to prejudice in our society. We welcome proposals to strengthen the bill in relation to the new stirring up offences to include the requirement of intention. Um, even after your amendments, however, Cabinet Secretary, it's still the case, isn't it, that this bill um, goes further than Lord Brackadale recommended. Um, in Section 3 of this bill, for example, um, uh, it is uh, provided that a person commits an offence if that person behaves in a threatening, abusive or insulting manner. This is with regard to stirring up racial hatred. Lord Brackadale recommended, recommended that we omit the word insulting. And this is a recommendation which was supported by the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society of Scotland. So why is the Scottish Government not listening to that advice? But it's interesting, the, the one group you don't mention in that is, of course, those that are the most impacted by racial stirring up of hatred. And that is, 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 a, is a principle that I live by. When making legislation, I've been a minister for uh, eight years uh, in the government, and, and I've always thought that that very famous principle of that what is about us without us is not for us is a very, very important principle to live by. I think you would agree with that, I suspect. And therefore, while I put a great degree of weight to the reflections advice and expertise of the Faculty of Advocates and Law Society, what I would say to you, convener, is I'd be very interested to hear the evidence, and I'm sure you will, I, I don't know for sure this is a decision for your committee, but when you do take evidence from groups uh, who represent those who are most targeted by racial stirring up offences and by racial hatred, they will tell you that they did not want any perceived, at least, at least perceived dilution or weakening of the current stirring up offence uh, of racial hatred, which has existed for 34 years, with barely, as far as I can see, but feel free to challenge this, barely any controversy uh, whatsoever. So while Lord Brackadale made his recommendation and I reflected on it, while some who are experts, particularly in the drafting of legislation, we should not, must not, and I'm not suggesting you are doing this, discount the real life experiences of those who are the victims of such crimes. No, absolutely, and this committee will of course be hearing from um, uh, uh, a broad range of witnesses um, that will uh, encapsulate and cover all of that and much more uh, in the course of our uh, stage one uh, inquiry. This is the last question from me in this session before I move on to uh, Rona Mackay. Um, but you've um, already ex explained, Cabinet Secretary, that the right to freedom of speech includes the right to uh, express yourself offensively. Um, but you've also said that you think that it should be a criminal offence uh, for somebody to speak in a manner that is insulting. There isn't much of a difference, is there, between being offensive and being insulting. So can you uh, explain to me what would be captured by the, by the criminalization in Section 3 of insulting speech that would not be captured if we took insulting out and made it a criminal offence only to speak in a threatening or abusive way. Because when we are um, consider considering the scope of the criminal law in this parliament, we've got to be careful not to under-criminalise, and that's the point you're making. We want to make sure that all of the harms and wrongs that we want to capture by the criminal law are indeed captured by the words on the page. But we also want to um, guard against um, over-criminalisation and making sure that we are not inadvertently rendering criminal that which we think we ought to be free to do. So, can you give me an example of a wrong or a harm that is criminalised 
by that word insulting in section three that needs to be criminalized and that would not be criminalized if we made the uh, threshold or the ingredients of the offense uh, threatening and abusive behavior. Again, you're, you're only referring to the, the, the starting of offence in relation to race. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important to, again, just reiterate that none of the other thresholds uh, include the word insulting. Uh, it is only included for the, the, the issue of race. Uh, and not only is it included in Scotland, uh, in the English and Welsh legislation for the racial starting up offence, that also includes insulting. Uh, and the Northern Irish uh, uh, offence that includes insulting. Uh, for interest for the Republic of Ireland defence also includes insulting. So this is not a new approach, it's an approach that's existed for 34 years with barely uh, any controversy. Suppose in one sense I could flip the question round and say, where do you think that it would be acceptable for somebody to insult somebody due to their race uh, and with the intent or likelihood of stunning up hatred, because that is the second part of the test, which is crucial, and that, sh that criminal sanction should not apply. So well, there may be, as, as you're implying, and Lord Brackaday, on fairness in his recommendation, I suspect this is why he asked us to, to consider removing insulting, there may not be um, much difference in terms of somebody being abusive or indeed insulting. But I think there could be examples uh, that, 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 it, that if we thought about where somebody could be insulting to somebody racially in terms of racial stereotypes uh, that are used. But remember, it also has to have the intent or the likelihood of stirring up hatred. If it does not, then it is not an offence uh, under this legislation. Thank you. You talk about this um, offence having been on the statute book for 34 years. And of course, that, that's true. But there are some really important differences uh, between this offence in the Public Order Act, which is in force now, and the version of this offence which appears on this bill. And a number of other members want to ask you questions about, about those differences. Um, uh, and Rona Mackay, I think, is in this area first. Rona. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I was going to ask you to um, you know, expand on the reasons for not including um, stirring up of racial hatred in the bill, but I think that's been, that's been covered. Um, could I ask you how you would respond to concerns that by not including it, um, it kind of provides a hierarchy of characteristics in the sense that, you know, if someone, um, if a hate crime involves race and another um, hate crime characteristic, you know, it kind of sets it apart from, from that. Can I ask you to respond to that? Yeah, I think it's a very fair question. Uh, and I suspect it's something that we'll, we'll come back to and, and people will continue to, to, to ask. I know certainly it was an issue that, if uh, my memory serves me correctly, the Law Society in particular were exercised about. So I think it is an issue that's certainly worthy of consideration and, and discussion. But I do think that there is a justification for treating the offence of racial hatred uh, different to the other characteristics. And we are treating it differently. There's no getting around that. There, are, there is a different threshold uh, in the law that we're proposing. Uh, if I give you one example of why I think that's justified, uh, it would be because of the statistics we have in front of us. Uh, if I look at the uh, COPFES data, Crown data uh, in relation to 2019-20, racial stunning up offences um, are 3,038, religion 660, sexual orientation 1,486, disability 387, transgender 41. So the offences in relation to racial hatred, this is for the aggravator, um, um, th 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 that, that crime is the most commonly by far, in fact more so than all the others combined. I think it makes up about 54, 55%. If I looked at the police data um, that was last published, in fact, the figures are even more stark. It's around about two thirds of racial, uh, related to racial hatred. So I think there can be a justification also because of the nature, the severity, the, 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 the nature of structural racism uh, that has existed for years and continues to exist. I think for all of these reasons, a justification can be made to treat it uh, in, in, in a way that is slightly different to the others. Thank you. I think the, the figures you've given um, demonstrate, um, you know, the need not to dilute, not to dilute it, which, if it had been included, would in fact probably had that effect. So, potentially had the perception of it being diluted, yeah. and I think for those who it affects, that is a, a very serious concern. But I should have said to the convener, just as I say to you, that you know we are not close-minded on considerations. 
uh, in relation to this offence. Uh, but I do think listening to the voices of those that are impacted the most is going to be uh, crucial. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Rona. Um, I think Annabelle Ewing wants to ask questions also in this area. And then after Annabelle Ewing, it will be James Kelly. Annabelle. Well, she's just warming up. Um, can somebody advise me about whether we've lost Annabelle or whether we haven't? Hi, I'm back. Okay, ah. I thought something was going on. Yes, thank you. So, uh, yes, good morning, Convener uh, and Cabinet Secretary. I wanted to, uh, uh, in terms of the stirring up um, section, uh, touch on the issue of uh, defences and the uh, defence of uh, reasonable behaviour. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that, in fact, there have been calls uh, to uh, see this fleshed out a bit in the body of the bill itself uh, uh, to uh, further clarity. And I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could uh, uh, give his uh, thoughts on that. Um, thank you for the question. I've thought long and hard about the reasonableness defence. Um, before the proposed changes that I made and thinking even harder about it now that I propose these changes because um, there are some compelling arguments around the reasonableness defence, for sure. I think one of the, the, the proponents of, of, of looking at a non-exhaustive list, for example, of factors that the judiciary should have regards to uh, in relation to reasonable defence has been um, Dr Andrew Tickell, somebody I've got a, a great amount of time for and, and I've spoken to uh, recently about uh, the bill on a couple of occasions. And um, for me, now that we've moved to intent only, I do struggle with the idea of a non-exhaustive list of factors. The reason I say that is because if I took the, the new stirring up offences, which are intent only, if I put the, the racial stirring up offence to, to one side for a second, if I took the new stirring up offences, I find it difficult to envisage where behaviour can be threatening or abusive with the intent of stirring up hatred and yet be justified as being reasonable. Now, if somebody can work out a scenario for me where that's the case, I'm all ears. Uh, I've yet to find one myself, but there are people, no doubt, who are smarter than me uh, considering this bill. Um, so I'd be interested to hear if there are examples of that um, so, in that regard, I'm still considering the reasonableness defence. I'm, I'm certainly all ears. I've, I've got a lot of sympathy for those that think it's, it, it's worth having, as I say, a non-exhaustive list. Um, but but, but, but as, as a mere you know, point of practice or operation, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I could envisage behaviour that would be, as I say, threatening or abusive with the intent of stirring up hatred, but yet be reasonable. I thank, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. I mean, I am aware that um, the reasonable, reasonableness test actually already exists without um, exhaustive or non-exhaustive definition in statute, but uh, obviously we're looking at this particular bill. Uh, one other question at this point, if I may, Convener, um, concerns this broad area of defences and looks at the issue of the private dwelling house conversations. And, of course, this has attracted under the freedom of expression concerns quite a number of comments uh, and I, I just wonder uh, what further thought the cabinet secretary may give to this specific issue um, he will be aware of um, concerns that have been raised that what you say in your own home should not really be in, in, in subject of engagement with criminal law and that's one view being put across I would imagine that there are other views and it'd be interesting to hear the cabinet secretary's thinking yeah, as, as always, I, I caveat this by saying we'll listen to the evidence uh, as it comes forward. Uh, I, I did meet with the Christian Institute, which are, are one of the organisations, I think, at the forefront of, of asking the government to consider a dwelling defence. And, and, and their argument is such that the dwelling defence exists in, 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 the, in the 1986 Act, and therefore 
the removal would, 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 would weaken protections and somewhat goes to, to what the convener was talking about in, in terms of erring on the side of, of caution when it comes to freedom of speech. My concern with the dwelling defence is, is, I suppose, in, in point of principle and policy, that again, if I looked at the new standing up offences that are being created, as a parliament, stroke even as a society, are we comfortable with giving a defence and law to somebody whose behaviour is threatening or abusive, and let's just give an example, which is intentionally stunning up hatred against Muslims. Are we saying that that is justified because it is in the home? Now, the reading of the dwelling defence is that, you know, so long as such behaviours are not heard by those outside of the dwelling, it doesn't say that the dwelling can't have X number of people inside that dwelling. But also, actually, the effect of threatening or abusive behaviour with the intent of stirring up hatred, the effect that that could have on other family members, children in particular, is pretty insidious. And are we saying that, as a society, we're comfortable with no criminal sanction being applied to people because that is being done in the confines of their dwelling, whereas if they stepped out into the street outside of their house then that would be a criminal offence. I'm just not convinced as a point of policy or principle that it's one that I agree with, but I'll continue to keep uh, an open mind. Um, uh, thank you, Annabelle. Thank you, Cabinet th 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 Secretary. Thank you, Annabelle. Can I just ask a follow-up on, on, um, on that very issue, Cabinet Secretary? And this, this, this bill is called the Hate Crime and Public Order Bill. Uh, and it replicates aspects of offences that currently exist in the 1986 Act that you've just referred to, which is, of course, called the Public Order Act. How can you commit an offence against public order in private? Well, actually, when it comes to the public order element of it, largely that is referring to the abolition of the blasphemy law. But I take your question um, as, as, as read, that the point of stirring up offences, and the reason why I think we need these offences is because their effect is, or could be, to motivate people to carry out acts of hatred, which include violence, assault, and so on, against members or groups uh, of, 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 of people who belong to, to, to particular communities. Now, all, all you of may, which would themselves if, be if criminal offences. Let me finish. I'll, I'll, all, all, all of which would themselves be criminal so offences. If you let me finish the point, that what it does is that if you are stirring up religious hatred you know, against Jews with the intent of stirring up hatred in your private dwelling with your children in the room with friends that you've invited over for a dinner party um, if they then act upon that stirring up of hatred and they then commit offences which you're right would then be prosecuted by the law should the person who with the intent of stirring up hatred and their behaviour was threatening or abusive should they not be culpable? Should they not receive some sort of criminal sanction? Now, your answer to that may be no, because it was done in the private dwelling. My answer to that is I think the criminal law should be looking at that stunning up of hatred because it had the intent of stunning up hatred. Remember, that intent has to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, and if that is the case, if that was your intention to stir up hatred against Jews, to make sure that those that listened to your words went out and stirred up that hatred, and committed offences against Jews, then I think that deserves criminal sanction. Liam Kerr wants to ask a supplementary before I bring James Kelly in. Liam. Thank you, Kavina. Very briefly, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Oh. I, I just want to follow up Annabelle's question about the reasonableness defence. I thought it was an interesting question, and I listened carefully to your answer. The burden is on the accused to bring forward enough evidence to avail themselves exactly. of that defence. The Sheriff's Association and the Crown Office have said that there's a need for clarification on the extent of that burden. Now, notwithstanding your point about the introduction of intent, isn't that clarity still required to enable the defence to know what they're going to have to adduce? I think it's a reasonable point to make. It's, it's, it's why I'm, I'm, I'm not dismissing the idea of, as I say, a, a kind of non-exhaustive list of, of, of factors. You know, do we consider that maybe explanatory notes or something else? I think there's two things we have to consider. One with the likely limb removed from, from the new stunning up uh, offences, do we need that? Is that still required? And I think the question I would also ask is, you know, do we uh, 
are we aware of the potential unintended consequences? So if we move to uh, uh, stirring, up stirring up offences that are intent only, and let's just say we give uh, uh, a, 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 a list of factors that have to be given consideration of, and let's, let's assume that one of them was, for example, uh, journalistic expression, you know, uh, co commonly asked about, you know, what we wouldn't want to do is give the likes of, you know, Tommy Robinson a defence by saying that he's a blogger who writes for the Patriot Times, and therefore, you know, my reasonable defence is that I'm a, I'm a journalist. Now, it wouldn't be as simple as that. Of course it wouldn't be. You would look at contextual factors and so on and so forth. But I just think we have to make sure that now that the likely limb has been removed, then we have to consider whether or not an ex non-exhaustive list of factors that sheriffs you know, predominantly should have regards to we just ensure that if we're going to do that, then is it needed? And secondly, let's ensure it doesn't have any unintended consequences. But I think the point the MCAM makes is a reasonable one that is worth consideration. Thank you. James Kelly, please. accept that hate crime legislation is important and it's important that it offers robust protections. Uh, for that to work effectively, the end product with this legislation must be uh, something that, whether you're a member of the public, a legal pr practitioner, or a member of the police force, you understand what the legislation means and what is an, an offence under the legislation. Uh, it's fair to say that the legislation as drafted uh, isn't clear enough uh, in, in regards to the categories that I've quoted. So, in terms of the amendments that you're bringing forward, how do you say that, the, that, the, that they address these issues of lack of legal clarity? So that, for example, if you take the Police Federation, uh, they felt they would have been put in a position where if someone... Uh, made a complaint about what they regarded as a, an offensive remark that was stirring up hatred, that they were being put in a position where they were having to make a judgment and they didn't feel that the legislation as drafted was clear enough. So how do you feel your amendments address those concerns? Yeah, uh, as, as a point uh, of, of, of note, uh, I listened or read carefully what the, the Police Federation had to say about the bill uh, as it was when it was introduced. I, I then spoke to the Police Federation after my proposed amendments. And, and again, I, I don't speak for the Police Federation. You, you may well call them for evidence. But it'd be fair to say that they, they, they thought that proposed change uh, was, 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 was a very welcome change and certainly provided some uh, reassurance to them. Now, I'm sure they'll have other questions around the bill, potentially maybe even other concerns around the bill, but, 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 but certainly without putting words into their mouth, having spoken to, to them after the proposed change, they were, they, they were certainly reassured to, to, to an extent. Uh, what I would say is that I think most of the concern around uncertainty um, in relation to the bill did, 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 was focused around the likely limb of the stunning up offences. People were, I think, unsure about whether their behaviours would inadvertently be captured by the bill as it was introduced. And while I could give a multitude of reasons why I don't think that would have been the case, there was clearly a perception that that was the case. And also what I didn't want was any degree of self-censorship. So for people to, 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 to not be sure, as you say, to, that there wasn't legal clarity, and therefore to start censoring their behaviour, particularly if they were in the artistic fields, uh, or indeed journalists, or, 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 or any such thing. So, so that is why I thought the proposed change to remove to intent only would provide uh, that clarity, because you know there are, you know, there is at the very least a, a triple lock in relation to those new offences. Um, you know, they they have to be proven beyond reasonable doubt the behaviour has to be threatening or abusive. And importantly, it has to have the intent uh, behind it. The mens rea has to be intent. Now, if we maintain the reasonableness defence, you could potentially argue that there's a quadruple uh, lock uh, in that. And, you know, if you wanted to include the freedom of expression clauses for certain uh, stunning up offences, uh, then you could even say uh, there, 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 there's a, a, a quintuple lock. Uh, 
uh, there as well. So I hope that would provide, you know, removing the likely limb would hopefully, uh, I would hope, uh, give the most reassurance and most clarity to people who were concerned previously. Okay. Uh, Liam McArthur, please. Thanks, uh, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I, I wanted to maybe just return to some of the um, issues that the Convener was raising um, at the outset in relation to freedom um, of uh, expression. Um, you'll be aware of the concerns that have been expressed and that actually some of the comparisons have been made between the protections um, uh, under the uh, under law in England and Wales. You yourself have made uh, comparisons uh, between that and, and what's contained in, in the bill. Um, and it does seem to be that the protections are more narrowly drawn and, and more generic in nature. Um, so I would be interested to know whether or not you've looked at the protect, uh, protections as they apply uh, under the English and Welsh law and whether or not they can be uh, applied through this bill. I, I think the, the other point to make is I note that um, the minutes of various meetings that uh, you've had on, on this bill have, have, have now been published, including the discussion that uh, you and I had uh, with uh, your officials, where um, I recall you referring to there being um, some uh, potential legal difficulties uh, in applying uh, freedom of expression uh, uh, protections. Uh, it would be helpful for the committee if you were to outline in a bit more detail what those d difficulties are. <coughs> so uh, I think it's a really good question, a set of questions from Lee MacArthur. Um, I think the way to look at this would be that, first and foremost, as, as I mentioned to the convener, we all know that our freedoms are protected under ECHR. So whatever is in the bill is supplementary to, 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 to that. But I do think it's important because I think people do look for additional reassurances uh, when it comes to the freedom of expression, particularly on a bill of, of, of this nature. What I would say to Lee MacArthur is I'm very actively considering both the breadth and the depth of freedom of expression clauses. So what do I mean by that? Um, in terms of the breadth, there's been an argument from a number of people that the freedom of expression clauses should not be limited to the two instances that they are at the moment, um, that they should cover other protected characteristics. I'm very open to that suggestion. I'm looking at that uh, suggestion. By depth, uh, what I mean by that is for the current freedom of expression clauses, could they go further? Uh, and I think he referenced in his question the, the, the legislation in England and Wales. Um, that includes, for example, when it comes to freedom of expression around religion, it includes uh, expressions of antipathy, ridicule, dislike, or insult, uh, or abuse. Um, again, I can confirm that's something I'm looking at, um, with perhaps the exception of abuse, because, as you know, the offences in Scotland are looking at threatening or abusive behaviour, whereas some of the setting up offences in England are threatening only. So it wouldn't make sense to have freedom of expression to cover abuse if or one of our thresholds is threatening or abusive behaviour, but with that exception, uh, the, the, the antipathy, ridicule, dislike or insult uh, is certainly a, 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 a phrase, uh, phraseology that I'm happy to look at uh, when it comes to the current freedom of expression clauses. In terms of legal difficulties, I don't, I don't want to stray into to, to, to our um, legal advice that, 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 that we take, so I'd make a very general point, uh, which is that, um, uh, you know, we... we, we we um, have to be aware of, of, of some of the concerns uh, that may be expressed. If we were to have a generic uh, freedom of expression clause, uh, would that be specific enough to give people the reassurances that they need or they require? So we're looking at all of those issues in the round. Uh, I would anticipate some further change around the freedom of expression clauses probably coming at stage two, uh, be it from members uh, or indeed possibly from the government, but it is an area under active consideration. I'll leave it there for time. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, before, before we move on to other areas of the bill, and I, I know a lot of members want to ask about um, statutory aggravation and the hate crime characteristics, and we're coming to that. Um, but before we leave the, the stirring up offences, uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I just ask you um, uh, one further question about the difference between uh, the way in which this bill seeks to legislate against stirring up offences and the way in which the Public Order Act or already does it. And, and, and you've said many times, both to here and uh, in the chamber and elsewhere, uh, 
um, that all, all, all you're doing here is um, putting um, on a, a fresh statutory footing offences which have been in existence for 34 years. There's a critical difference, isn't there, between the way in which the stirring up offence is legislated for in Section 18 of the Public Order Act and the way in which you're proposing to do it in Section 3 uh, of this uh, bill, which is that um, uh, the 1986 Act makes it plain that where someone does not intend to stir up uh, racial hatred, they are not guilty of an offence uh, if they were not aware that their behaviour might be threatening uh, or abusive. And there is no equivalent of, to this provision uh, in uh, the bill. And as far as I recall, there's no reference to this omission in the uh, policy memorandum accompanying the bill, although forgive me if I've got that wrong. So wh why do you not want to have an equivalent to that provision in this legislation? I'm more than happy to look at that, but again, it might come back to a question of, of, of whether or not that would be covered by a reasonableness defence. You know, would the defence be reasonable uh, if somebody was to state that uh, you know they, 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 they did not know that they were committing, uh, their, their behaviour was threatening or abusive uh, when it comes to the racial stirring up offence, uh, where, where there still is a likely... Uh, who'd limb. So uh, if we think there is a gap there in terms of how the offences translate from the 1986 Act, and there are differences, I've already touched on the dwelling defence and why I think uh, that difference uh, is justified, uh, then, 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 then let's look at that with an open mind. Thank you. Um, I think James Kelly wants to ask a question about Section 4, which is on theatres and plays, and then we'll move on to other areas of the bill. Okay, thanks, uh, convener. Um, you'll be aware that the Law Society uh, offered criticism in terms of Section 4 in relation to plays being captured, perf performances being captured under the bill. Um, I mean, plays and performances, by their very nature, uh, sometimes can be, as you acknowledged earlier in your contrib contribution, can be provocative. And people attending those performances are, are aware of that. Um, so why did, you, why did you feel it was necessary to, to introduce that section and do you not feel that it, uh, it you know, perhaps leads to kind of further confusion? So um, this is a bit more difficult to do uh, with my officers behind me, but I'll just uh, turn to them because I'm absolutely sure that there's a section on performance and plays in the 1986 Act uh, as well in terms of racial stirring up offence. That would connect, uh, so uh, when, we're, when, we're, when we're looking at, 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 at similar provisions for the new standing up offences, um, this is not particularly new because it exists in the, in, in the 86 Act. So what I would say... Um, but in quite different form in the 1986 Act from in your, from in your bill. So, sure, and I'll come to that in, in, in a second. But what I would say is that when it comes to performances and plays, the reason why that's in the bill, and I, and I, and I, and I understand why there's been some questioning of that. In fact, I, I met with a group of uh, organisations that represent artists, performers, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and their concern was around larger and the likely limb uh, and, 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 and the concerns around why they felt they were being, why was there a section of the bill that targeted performances and plays and they wanted to understand that rationale better. And the reason why it's in the bill is, is again for issues of culpability. So if a director of, of a play who himself or herself will not speak the words that are threatening or abusive with the intent of stirring up Know, religious hatred, for example, but through uh, you know, uh, but, but but actively, uh, and 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 the bill uh, talks about this, of course. But but you know, they were very much, uh, and should be very much culpable of that offence uh, because they had a part in it. But they may not have spoken those words or acted that behaviour. Then there is culpability there, and I think that's absolutely right. What it doesn't do. And, and there's been some suggestions of this, you know, that, for example, if a performer is playing a r racist character or you know, a character that is exhibiting religious hatred, then that behaviour is not likely to be threatening or abusive with the intention of stirring up hatred. And it has to fulfil those two-part tests uh, for it to be prosecuted uh, under the offence. And I think that's really, really important. And when it comes to the 1986 Act, where, although the convener uh, right to interject that there are differences in how that's uh, written up, that in those 34 years, there have been a multitude 
of performances, plays, broadcasts, other things that have included racist characters. Um, and to my knowledge, and again, I'm happy to be challenged in this, uh, there has not been a prosecution that has caused concern uh, in those 34 years amongst the artistic uh, community. And I think the last thing I'd say on this is when I made the change or pro the changes that I'm proposing to make, uh, I was pleased that Scottish Penn, who are one of those who have argued about, uh, raised some of the concerns that James Kelly raises, uh, they said Scottish Penn welcomes the announcement that key changes will be made to proposed hate crime public order Scotland bill, uh, including a requirement that the intention to stir up hatred is proven beyond a reasonable doubt before an offence can be prosecuted. So I hope that would give some element uh, of reassurance. Uh, I'm, I'm not totally convinced, I have to be honest. Can you give an example uh, in recent Scottish history of a player performance that you think caused an issue and would be captured under this and people would in your view, be legitimately prosecuted? Uh, no, because I, I, don't think, I don't think people put on plays, um, you know, often with this, uh, you know, intention. But where there is an intention, you know, by a far-right group to put on a performance for a limited audience of their supporters, um, you know, which is there to, you know, where the behaviour is threatening or abusive with the intention of stirring up rel religious hatred, then that should be prosecuted, not just the performer, but for example, if the director, who did not speak any words, but directed the play that was threatening or abusive uh, with, the, with the intent of stirring up religious hatred, if that was done, uh, then, then, then um, I think it's important that that is uh, prosecuted. And, and, and it should say that when it comes to the commission of the offence, it has to involve the consent or connivance on the part of the person or is attributable to the neglect of the part of such a person. Now, where I think there's a, a, a fairly strong argument from, from, from those in the performance sector is that second limb. Um, you know, now the offences are intent only. Uh, you know, sh is there a need for it to be attributable to neglect? I'm happy to look at that uh, again uh, and see whether that is necessarily needed. But if a director, and I, I, I wonder if, you know, flipping the question around, would James Kelly suggest that if a director, you know, consented, you know, connived to put on a play that was threatening or abusive with the intent, and remember that is the crucial part, with the intent to stir up hatred against those with a disability, is he suggesting that they should avoid culpability? My argument would be they should not avoid culpability. What I'm trying to understand is your motivation for introducing this section, and um, you've not been able to co quote any specific examples in recent Scottish history where there's been a performance that uh, would be covered under this and therefore requires this, uh, this section to be included. But if there was, then should there not be the assurance and reassurance around the culpability of those that have been involved, my, my argument would be yes. And I, I think, again, what we're looking to do is the protections that exist for, for somebody like me because of my race, then they should also apply to people in relation to the other protected characteristics. I think this is a, an issue that will continue to play out, can we? Thank, thank you, James. I'm going to bring in uh, John Finney in one second, but um, can I just ask the Cabinet Secretary, Cabinet Secretary, you've indicated that you're open-minded yeah. about the, um, the structure and wording of defences elsewhere in the bill. Uh, one of the key differences between Section 4 of this bill and the existing provision that, cover, that covers performances in theatre, yeah. which is Section 20 of the Public Order Act, is that Section 20 of the Public Order Act contains a whole series of defences, none of which... Um, have made it into your bill. Are you open-minded to the bringing in of some defences with regard to the um, uh, Section 4 offence, or is that something that you're not... Uh, is, is, there, is there a reason for, for, for not bringing in defences into Section so 4? So, in, in, in short, uh, yes, I'd be open-minded uh, to that. Again, my concern would be similar to what I referenced to Liam Kerr previously, is, is, is unintended consequences, particularly when we moved to uh, the intent uh, only offence. If it's okay, I, I may bring in uh, Philip Lamont, who's, who's behind me to, to talk in, in, in a bit more detail around the differences between the, the 86 Act and, and now, but in short, uh, 
the answer to your question would be yes. There's no close-mindedness uh, here, even when I object to particular um, defences, you know, the dwelling defence in, in relation to policy or principle, I'm still keeping an open mind to it. But Philip, I mean, I don't in, know if you... Before you yeah. bring in your official, and just, just to specify what I mean, uh, in section uh, 20 of the Public Order Act, it's a defence um, that the person did not know and had no reason to suspect that the offending words or behaviour were threatening or abusive, that he did not know, he or she did not know, and had no reason to suspect that the circumstances in which the performance would be given would be such that racial hatred would be likely to be stirred up. I mean, but, those seem yeah. to me to be reasonable defences, and they're not in uh, your bill. It must have been a conscious decision as to, you know, you, w w what Section 4 is, is, a, is it's a transcribing of a current offence from Section 20 of the Public Order Act into this bill, um, and all of these defences are missing in that transcription. There must have been a reason why yes, but would uh, you I be, thought that the, the defences were unnecessary. Yes, but again, going back to my previous point, and I'll double-check this with my officials, but, you know, this may well be what would be covered by a potentially reasonableness defence. And, of course, any court, any sheriff would take into account contextual factors. They would take into account any of those factors uh, in relation to, to, to somebody's uh, intent or, indeed, uh, yeah. Otherwise, when Fact, it comes but to the reasonableness, the de up but the reasonableness defence isn't in this section. Doesn't the reasonableness defence pertains to, to, to offences in section three and section five, but not to offences in yeah. section four? It's a big but omission. What, no, what I mean is, and what I'm saying is similar to my answer to Liam Kerr, that any sheriff, any judge would take into account a whole range of contextual factors. Now, if your argument back is that those contextual factors should be in the face of the bill as they were in the 1986 Act. That's something I'm saying to you I'm not close-minded to. Okay. Uh, but as a matter of point and principle, I think any sheriff, any judge would look at those contextual factors. But I don't know if Philip wants to add anything further to that. Um, not too much to add. Um, obviously, Section 4, the culpability only applies if an offence is also committed under Section 3. It requires a Section 3 offence, probably by the performer, in order to open the door to a Section 4 offence. Um, so there is a reasonableness defence in Section 3, but I think it is right, as the Cabinet Secretary said, that we're open-minded to consider whether there does need to be something further there, either some prescriptive defences or actually just ensuring that the reasonableness defence, which would, in our view, capture the type of defences that are in the 86 Act already, in a general way, might need to be applied more directly to Section 4. That's a very helpful clarification. Thank you for that. Right, we're going to move now to um, part one of the bill, which is statutory aggravation. Uh, and uh, John Finney uh, is going to open the questioning on that. And then after John Finney, it'll be Shona Robison, please. John. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and uh, officials. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I, I know what you said earlier about the relationship be between the extensive piece of work that Lord Brackadale did and what we have in front of us um, to scrutinise at the moment. Um, I'd like to ask about the statutory hate crime aggravation. Lord Brackadale recommended that statutory aggravation should continue to be the core method of prosecuting hate crime in Scotland. I wonder, do you agree? And are you confident that the proposed expansion of stirring up offences will not undermine this? Um, can I thank John Finney uh, for the question. I think I got uh, all, all of the question. Um, I, I think it's undoubtedly going to be the case that regardless of the expansion of the stirring up, excuse me, of hatred offences, that the statutory aggravators will still be the way that the the the, the way that the courts will choose to prosecute crimes uh, involving hatred. Um, I don't think that will change. Uh, we see with the racial stirring up offence which, remember, has a lower th threshold than the other stirring up offences that we are proposing, um, that they have been prosecuted a handful of times over the last seven, eight years in comparison to the statutory aggravator in relation to racial hatred, which has been prosecuted uh, uh, or been added to, 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 to an offence thousands of times uh, over that same time period. So I don't think it will make a difference, particularly because the new stirring up offences are, are such a high legal threshold, uh, as I've mentioned, beyond reasonable doubt, threatening or abusive with the intent of stirring up hatred uh, is quite a high legal threshold that has to be met. Um, so I suspect that the majority of prosecutions will still happen via statutory aggravators. OK, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Can I, can I move to another point there? And that is um, where an offence is proven to be aggravated by prejudice, the bill states that the court must make clear what difference the aggravation has made to the sentence imposed. Lord Brackadale recommended removing this requirement 
Um, indeed, the senators of the College of Justice have described it as, and I quote here, a somewhat artificial exercise. Now, it's self-evident transparency in sentences is clearly important. But this uh, provision, uh, do you think this provision really helps achieve that? So the reason, the reason why I suppose I disagreed um, with Lord Brackadale's recommendation was, again, going back to my earlier point, that it's important to engage with those who are themselves the victims of, of, of hate crime. And when we spoke to organisations that represent victims, uh, not just racial equality groups, though, 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 though they were also uh, in support of the action uh, the government was taking in this regard, but, but victims groups more broadly, then they felt it was very, very important for the victim's sake to know what any additionality to a sentence may well have been because of the statutory aggravator. Uh, and for them, it, for the victim involved, it meant it was quite an important factor. So having listened to the evidence from the victims' organisations, uh, as well as various equality groups, uh, that's why we didn't proceed with Lord Brackadale's recommendation. Can I ask if you feel that you're perhaps uh, gilding things a little bit here? Because surely um, any uh, judicial sentencing would have due regard to that if it's a factor that's been considered anyway. And that's perhaps why the senators of the College of Justice described it as an artificial exercise, a somewhat artificial exercise. Uh, that, that, that is uh, an opinion. Uh, that is a perspective. But I think there's also, as I say, a victim's perspective, which we can't forget. And that victim's perspective is that they would want to know what any additionality to that sentence may well be. Um, so, so, so I think it's a perspective, but it's 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 one that I know has been challenged quite vociferously from from victims, and, and I suspect as a committee, you'll hear from a number of organisations that represent uh, victims uh, of of of, of, our, of various hate crime. And I'd be interested if you put a similar question to them, what their what their response was. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Kavita. Uh, thank you, uh, John. Uh, Shona, do you have questions in this uh, area as well? Yes, thanks, Kavita. I want to come on to terminology, but just on the last question from John Finney, it was just so I'm clear, is this really about more consistency and transparency in um, making clear um, in a judgment where aggravation has been a factor? Because at the moment, is it a bit inconsistent in terms of whether a judge clearly explains, which some obviously do, where there has been a, an aggravating factor that is sometimes explained in the, the judgment? Would this make it more consistent so that the victims can consistently have a, an explanation of what that has meant in terms of the sentencing? Is that part of the purpose? Well, I certainly hope it would have that effect. I, I do think at the moment, um, you know, I, I speak to a number of people who, who have been victims of 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 of, of uh, crimes that have been aggravated by 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 hatred, and and you know, I'm I'm one of those people, uh, and, and 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 you know, that case has gone to court, um, and 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 they've often said that they would want that level of clarity and that level of consistency. So, by by you know, having it on the statute that the court must state on conviction that the offence is aggravated by prejudice, you know, record the conviction in a way that shows that the offence is, is aggravated uh, and take the aggravation into account in determining the appropriate sentence and state um, where the sentence in respect of the offence is different, that which the court would have imposed if the offence was not aggravated, I think that provides a, a level of consistency, clarity um, that victims would want. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, just a question on terminology. I think you've previously expressed a willingness to reconsider the use of some of the terminology used in the bill, including the, the phrase uh, evinces malice and ill will. Um, what's your current thinking on this? It's a challenging one because words uh, do matter and terminology does matter, uh, particularly in the, in, in the law. And although I completely respect that evinces malice and ill will is not, you know, the most easily understood terminology, I suppose there was a bit of a concern that if we moved to Lord Brackadale's recommendation on this, that it may well weaken the threshold slightly. Um, notwithstanding that, I, I'm, I, I am open-minded and perhaps a, a, a kind of hybrid um, would be to, to look at the wording of demonstrates 
malice and ill will towards the victim, so it doesn't lose the malice and ill will part, but perhaps replaces the, the invinces um, part, which is probably not well understood uh, by most people, I suspect. So, so, so those are active considerations at the moment. Um, I haven't come to a final judgment. I'm quite interested, actually, in uh, the committee's uh, uh, oral evidence that it takes on, on this issue. Thanks for that. I mean, I, I, I think it's a personal view that where, where possible, we should seek to modernise language and terminology, for the, for the, not least for aiding uh, the public's understanding. So I think that is something that would, that would be welcome. Uh, that's everything from you, Convener. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Shona. Annabel, I think um, uh, if you want to ask any further questions on uh, the hate crime uh, oh, sorry, on the um, statutory hate crime aggravation, then please feel free to do so. But then also, if you want to move on to hate crime characteristics, I know you've got questions in that area too. Okay. Uh, thanks, Computer. I did have one brief follow-up on this issue that Shona Robertson has, has raised. Um, whilst, as a lawyer, you know, we do like our arcane language, but I do take the point that she makes. And just in that regard, I had understood, in fact, that the uh, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service felt actually that you could move to uh, Lord Brackadale's suggested formulation, uh, or perhaps something like it, without really changing the, the test being applied. Uh, and um, uh, also, I, I know that the Cabinet Secretary had indicated that he would engage further on the matter, and I just wonder what the, the stage he has reached with his further engagements on this particular issue. Yeah, so th th those conversations very much continue, and, and of course, uh, you know, the, cr the Crown's thoughts on this are, are pivotal to our consideration. Uh, on, on, on the matter. So it's, it's why I'm committed to looking at the issue. And as I say, there may be a, a, a you know, particularly for the word evinces, I think there's probably a strong argument that that should be replaced with language that is better understood. I'm just quite keen to test if we move away from malice and ill will, whether there's any uh, le practical legal effect, particularly of weakening um, part one of the bill. But, but, but I'm seeking those assurances as we speak. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer, and if I may convene and move on indeed to uh, the next uh, part of our discussions this morning. And my question concerns uh, the non-inclusion of the characteristic of sex in the bill uh, as it currently stands. And I understand that, in fact, uh, in addition to Lord Brackadale having recommended the inclusion of, of the characteristic of sex in the bill itself, support for such a position has also been expressed by, amongst others, COSLA, the Faculty of Advocates, Police Scotland, and the Organisation for Women Scotland. Um, and it would just be helpful, I think, um, if the Cabinet Secretary could um, just clarify the, the, the rationale for the approach that he has taken thus far on this matter, notwithstanding the, the clear views expressed by many others that this would not be the optimal approach. Thank you. So it's a really good and very important question. I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to listening to the arguments of this, and, and I have uh, done so. I've engaged with um, a number of the groups uh, that Annabelle, not all of them right enough, but a number of the groups that, that Annabelle uh, Ewing mentions in the run-up to this uh, introduction of the bill. What I'd also say is that when Lord Brackadale made his recommendations, I was quite keen to speak to the largest national women's organisations, organisations that represent women, that are well known to this committee, and I suspect will probably, uh, no doubt, at least in some part, be invited to, to, to supplement their written evidence. And those organisations in gender, Zero Tolerance Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland, uh, if I'm not incorrect, uh, though I'm happy to correct the record if I am wrong on this, I mean, I think all four of them oppose the introduction of a gender or sex aggravator. And genders particularly led the, the campaign against it, and, and they produced a briefing uh, and published a report on the reasons why, and I think they distributed that report to every MSP. And there are, I can see from their perspective, some compelling arguments not to introduce a sex aggravator, particularly as it doesn't, doesn't take note of the gendered nature of violence against women. A sex aggravator. They're worried in some parts, and I think Scottish Women's Aid are worried about this, 
could be used by perpetrators of domestic abuse um, to, 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 to further cause um, challenge and difficulty for victims of domestic abuse. So there are a whole range and there's a whole report, as I say, of reasons why there's a number of organisations, national organisations, that don't want a sex activator or gender activator introduced. I then decided to meet with some local organisations that represent women and work with them very much in the co-face at a local level. And again, we can provide details of, of who those organisations were. And I met with those organisations on a couple of occasions and, 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 and fair to say that a number of them, not all of them, but a number of them align themselves with the view of, of, of engender uh, and, and the other organisations. So it's a very live debate. It's why I think the misogynistic well, working, uh, harassment working group um, is very important because I think they should look at this issue. I think that's why an enabling power is a good idea because it allows... Uh, after consideration and detailed consideration if, if a sex activator is wanted uh, and, and, and seen as needed as part of the solution to tackle this issue, then it should be able to be brought forward. But it's not a clear it's not clear cut uh, that it would have the effect that some people think it may well might well have. I, I thank the cabinet secretary for his answer. If I may ask one more question, convener, before you go on to, to colleagues. Um, I, I mean, yes, there's always a, an interesting debate to be had on, on most worthwhile things in life. Um, I'm just worried, though, that we've got the opportunity of this bill and, you know, going down a sort of side route. I don't know time-wise where that takes us. It's, it would seem to me to take us some years down the line to some other position. And I think that surely has to be one of the, the factors that is, you know, in the balance in addition to all the things that the Cabinet Secretary has said, and indeed the opposing views that all the other organisations have raised. But pres presumably we just need to ensure that we don't leave any gaps. I agree entirely with Annabel Ewing's uh, summation of the issue. I, I think that you know the, the order-making power for me leaves open the ability to add sex as an aggravator if after consideration of the oral evidence um, from, from from a range of groups, the the, 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 the members came forward with amendments to, to suggest that an aggravator should be included uh, in all of these matters, and this one in particular, the government will keep an open mind. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Captain Sector. Thank you, Annabel. I know that um, uh, Liam MacArthur wants in, but I, um, uh, Rona Mackay and Fulton McGregor are also due to ask questions in, in this. So, Liam, if it's okay, I'll bring you in after we've um, gone to Rona and Fulton. So, it'll be Rona next and then Fulton. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, just really following up from that, um, with regards to the, the standalone offence of misogynistic harassment, um, you said in the chamber and you, you said today that. Um, the proposed working group would be set out in October. And um, we're coming towards the end of October. Can you tell us where we are with that? Yeah, in truth, I would have liked to have been a little bit further down uh, the line. You know, undoubtedly, the, the challenges of, of, of COVID-19 uh, have, have impacted on this work even before my statement um, to, 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 to Parliament. However, what I can say is that um, the process of an appointment of a potential chair is, is very much underway, um, which is positive. And, and I think once that chair is appointed, then working with her, working with that individual uh, to, to work through the remit uh, will be hugely important. But what we are, in very broad terms, looking for that group to do is, firstly, there's a real need for that group to address the lack and the shortage of administrative data that might provide quite detailed information to fully understand what women's experiences are in terms of misogynistic harassment. I think the group then is, is, is a kind of second phase, has to look at the legal context where there are potential gaps in the law that exists. That includes what we've just discussed about potential for a sex uh, aggravator, but also whether or not uh, a standalone offence of misogynistic harassment um, could fit within a legal framework and be an effective tool. Um, and, 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 and so that, that, that those are the kind of broad areas of work. But uh, I'd hope to be able to update the parliament relatively short order around the appointment of a chair 
uh, and then the the, 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 the the chair, of course, will, 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 will work with the chair in terms of a remit. I should say that the membership of any organisation, of, of this working group, should be very broad in its nature. It should take into account women's organisations, of course, um, also academics, as well as those that have an expertise in the law uh, uh, as well. So our stakeholders, from a legal perspective, are going to be incredibly important in this regard as well. Is it possible for you to say um, what sort of time scale you're putting on this group for the remit? You know, is, is there any um, deadlines? I'm very careful, because obviously um, th th there are a number of pressures uh, on us, but the appointment process of the chair is, is very much underway, so I'd hope that within a matter of weeks that I'd be able to confirm to Parliament the chair and therefore the remit would flow very much from that, as would the membership, although we've got, we've got a broad idea of, of the membership. We'd obviously want the chair's input into that. But in terms of the work that they're carrying out, you know, is there any kind of end date for when you come to conclusions? I, I think that would be really important to include the chair in, in that. I mean, I would want them to... I would want the chair and the members because the work plan would be one of the very first things that that group would have to look at. And I'd want the work plan to be dictated not by me in government, um, but by the chair and the members of that group. I think it's important that they are very comfortable with what we're asking them to do um, and the phases of work that they're doing. Um, so, so I couldn't give you an exact timetable. That would be for the working group to, to come forward with. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, on, just on the question of, um, of, of timing in that, in, in that, in that, uh, that group's work, um, we are set to take evidence on this issue on the 24th of November. Um, is there any prospect uh, of the group reporting and finalising views before before then? No, I mean it would be unrealistic to suggest that they would. Uh, of, of all the work that I've just described there, in terms of the lack of administrative data, consideration of the legal context, um, no, no, I wouldn't expect them to do that. I think the work would take uh, some months to work through uh, in terms of the standalone offence. But it's why also we've brought forward the order making power, so that if this bill is passed, then at any time it would be possible for that sex activator to be added if that working group and indeed ultimately parliamentarians were convinced that it was needed um, and that would be through, through, so it, through an affirmative order. So it's more likely that this committee's evidence on this issue will feed into the work of the group than the other way around? Well potentially I'm, I'm, I'm certain that the group would have an interest in the committee's deliberations and the evidence sessions that it takes. Okay. Um, th th thank you Renaud. Um, uh, Fulton yeah. McGregor also has questions uh, in this area Cabinet Secretary so we'll turn to him next. Fulton McGregor please. And thanks, convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I wanted to ask you about the um, the hate crime characteristic of race, and it covers race, colour, nationality, uh, or ethnic or national organisations. I'm wondering if you could also confirm that this definition covers some groups who may also be covered by religion, and, and expand a wee bit on your thinking uh, in this area of the hate crime characteristic. So there are some religious groups or groups that we would tend to think of as, as religious groups that I know um, would would also describe themselves as 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 groups that would be covered under under race. Um, so I know, for example, that the Sikh community were pushing uh, to be recognised under the race characteristic uh, when it came to the consent uh, the census. Sorry, um, if I'm not correct, but I, uh, if I'm if I'm not correct in this, I'm of course happy to be corrected. Um, I think that issue also applies to the Jewish community, who I think under the current rules and the consensus are also uh, categorised as, 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 as a race and they have their reasons uh, absolutely for that. Um, I think when it came to when it comes to uh, statutory aggravators it's obviously for the court to decide uh, what aggravator applies uh, in what particular circumstance uh, and it wouldn't be for me but I, I would see no reason why um, those groups uh, would have any concern uh, that, 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 that the, the aggravator as it currently is drafted would not include them, or the possibility to include them, but it would ultimately be for the courts to determine that. Um, thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary, for that clarification. And, and moving on a wee bit from, um, from your answer there, we've had some suggestions, uh, as you'll be aware, um, to the proposed take crime characteristics including to cover uh, gypsy travellers, 
uh, asylum seekers and refugees. Are, are you able to expand on your views on this and to what extent might they already be covered in the characteristic of race? Um, I think for a number of other groups, uh, there, there, there was a feeling from Lord Brackadale uh, that they would be covered under the current definition uh, of race if there was particular groups that had a concern around that. Uh, and I know there's been some that have been expressed by uh, those from the, the gypsy travelling traveller community <clears throat> in regards to whether they would be covered. But it was certainly Lord Brackadale's view that they would be. But it is an issue that we're reflecting on further. But, but I do think those groups um, would be covered by what is a fairly broad definition of, of race. OK, thanks for that. Uh, can you not have any further questions as such? But I, I just wanted to um, put on the record my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for um, his intention to attend the cross-party group on racial equality that I, uh, that I chair in its, this Thursday. And the topic is, of course, the, the, the hate crime legislation. And the, um, the Cabinet Secretary did mention earlier the importance of speaking to um, various stakeholders and those impacted um, by hate crime. And I know that the members of the group, it's a large membership, are, are very eager to speak to uh, the Cabinet Secretary on these very issues and how they've been impacted. So, again, I thought it important to place on the record my thanks for him taking the time to do that. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Fulton. Always um, welcome a plug for a, a forthcoming meeting of a cross-party group, especially on, a, on an issue as, a, as important as this. I think Liam MacArthur wanted to come in on this area before we move on. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kevin. Just returning to the, the, the subject yourself and, uh, and others, uh, Annabel Ewing were referring to in relation to the um, uh, sex aggravator with the misogynistic harassment working group. I mean, I think we all um, understood and, and I think welcomed the establishment of that group. I think the concern is that with the passing of time, it's leaving us in, in an incredibly difficult position. And, and I think, as the convener alluded to, there's a there's a risk almost that the, that the process is reversed with us feeding into the group rather than the group feeding into our deliberations. And the concern, albeit that the order making power is there, is that we find ourselves in a position that even under an affirmative um, instrument procedure, this Parliament is going to have inadequate um, time uh, and, uh, and uh, potential to scrutinise what will be probably a very sensitive, um, detailed bit of, of, of legislation. Is that a concern that, um, that the government's taking as seriously as I believe it absolutely should be? I completely would, would, would reflect on, on, on those concerns, and, and, and I understand uh, those concerns that Liam MacArthur Articulate it's what I would say to you is that, you know, with the establishment of the working group, you would have a, a working group that I think we would all agree, once you see, hopefully, the chair and the, and the membership of that group, that real expertise uh, in, in, in issues that, um, that, that, that uh, affect women and issues of the law uh, and the legal landscape. And what that group will do, you know, if you came to a future consideration, so let's say the bill is passed um, uh, with the proposed uh, amendments that I suggest, what you would then have is um, the order making power, as you say, under affirmative SSI. Now, when you were considering that, you wouldn't be considering that affirmative SSI blind. You'd be uh, considering that with the weight of the evidence submitted by the misogynistic harassment working group. Um, and, and, and their views on whether or not such an order making power should or should not be made. So, you know, I'd hope that you would have that weighty consideration whenever that may be. And I respect what you say. It, you know, uh, could 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 be could be the fact that you're feeding into some of their considerations. Um, but you know, I take the point on board. Uh, but I do think it's why an order making power uh, is important. Now, of course, there is nothing stopping. Uh, a member coming at stage two um, to bring forward an amendment, not to have an order making power, but to actually have a sex aggravator. Uh, now, now, if that is something a member wished to do after consideration of the oral evidence from women's organisations, then they're free to do that. And, and the government will give that uh, consideration. I am not on this issue, um, as with other issues I've said, close-minded to, to consideration. But I think the problem is, and, and I don't dispute for a second, without knowing who it is that um, is likely to chair and be a member of the, the working group, that you will have a, a, a broad base of, of um, very relevant expertise in this area. And, and, and obviously, um, that is of some reassurance. But ultimately, it is for 
um, this committee and this parliament um, to be taking forward um, legislative proposals and scrutinising them. And it does rather feel as if uh, we're being left in a position where our ability to do that is, is somewhat compromised um, by the, uh, the, the process we're now locked into. And we will see what happens in terms of the evidence, but I, I think it's important to put on record certainly a concern that, 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 that I have, and I, I suspect other members will share it to a greater or lesser extent. I'm happy to reflect on, on that concern. I think a number of us might also have a concern, general concern about making about the creation of criminal offences by a secondary instrument. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, there's a very strong presumption uh, that the scope of the criminal law should be a question of primary legislation and, and not secondary instruments. But these are all issues that we will consider. Liam Kerr also wants to come in on this. Yeah, before, just very briefly before, to before we move to back to John Finney pick up on exactly that point um, and just some I, I find this a particularly interesting area that I know the cabinet secretary does and just going back Rona Mackay asked much earlier on about stirring up potentially creating a, a hierarchy of characteristics and it, it, it might be argued that that's what this part one would do around sex by by omitting a sex aggravator you almost establish a hierarchy of characteristics that enjoy legal protections and those that do not uh, and so the question is really do, do you see that that is a risk that could happen and, and what's your view on the faculty of advocates suggestion that MSPs rather than a working group are, are more appropriate to be looking at this area so there's obviously nothing stopping MSPs from 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 looking at this area uh, in detail if the justice committee wanted to or individual MSPs wanted to do that uh, th th then of course they could do that and bring forward um, you know or urge the government to bring forward an, an, an order making uh, bring forward the affirmative SSI to create a sex activator there's nothing stopping members from, from from doing that or you know we can think about ways in which MSPs may be able to participate or indeed take evidence from the likes of the misogynistic working uh, harassment group in terms of the addition of an aggravator and 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 the perception of, of, of a hierarchy is something I'm very very interested in in the sense that you know I can understand why the omission of a sex aggravator um, in the list of characteristics um, could be concerning to a number of women and I've heard that expressed since the introduction uh, of the bill it's why I think that the oral evidence that this committee will take as well as the various publications that have been made by the likes of Engender Scotland and others are so so important because they go into a level of nuance and detail um, that I think a number of us would find interesting particularly in relation to remembering that a sex aggravator would um, for all intents and purposes apply to both men and women and therefore there's a concern that um, from, 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 from a number of stakeholders that I think we all respect around this table that such an aggravator could be used uh, in, in, in such a way uh, even if it's not prosecuted but certainly used to, to make uh, claims um, uh, or accusations against the victims of, of domestic abuse and there's a bit of a concern around that plus other concerns that have been raised so I take the point that Liam Kerr makes about the perception of the omission um, and I do think it's why the government and I, I commit to this keep an open mind on how this progresses I do also think and I know the committee will do this hugely important the evidence is taken and the views are listened to for those that do have a genuine concern about a sex activator Okay, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, John Finney wants to ask uh, about racially aggravated uh, harassment, which is another aspect of uh, hate crime legislation that we've not yet uh, touched on this morning. John. Uh, thank you again, convener. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, Cabinet Secretary, Lord Brackadale re recommended repealing the offence of racially aggravated harassment, uh, and uh, the Scottish Government didn't accept that recommendation. Can you say why, if such an offence is thought necessary in relation to race, it's not considered for other character? So I take, I take the point that Lord Brackadale made around the repeal of, of, of Section 50A. And actually, my initial consideration was that we should repeal Section 50A for all the reasons that Lord Brackadale made. Um, the reason why I changed my mind in relation to that consideration was due to the very, very strong representations I had from a variety of racial equality groups. Lord Brackadale and I attended a conference um, 
organised by Bemis, a black and ethnic minority infrastructure Scotland. Um, and it had a, a number of racial equality groups there. And it's fair to say from that meeting that both Lord Brackadale and I were at, that there was very, very strong representations about why they would not want to see the repeal of 50A, because again, at the very least, at the very least, they saw it as, as as a weakening of the current protections that they have uh, for 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 for, for uh, racial minorities in particular. I suppose it just goes back to my earlier point to Rona Mackay in the evidence session that there is, I think, a justification looking at the data, the numbers of those that are affected by racial hatred crimes, that that there is a justification for treating uh, racial hatred in a slightly different way to the other protected characteristics. But it's a debate that will be very live as the consideration of this bill continues, one which I'll keep a close ear and eye on. I wonder if you, if you would feel that, given that this is consolidating legislation, indeed tidying up, that there was not an opportunity to to address the concerns that Demas and others have, which obviously I would share. I wouldn't want any dilution. But does it not leave it looking a bit cluttered? I, I didn't get the last part of what you said, sorry. Would it not? So I, I wondered if uh, not repealing uh, the offence of racially aggravated harassment leaves the legislation looking a bit con cluttered, oh, cluttered and confused, given that there is a negative. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I think it's an argument that could be made. The, 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 you know, as you rightly say, this bill is is one that is looking to consolidate. Hate crime is quite fragmented in terms of legal landscape at the moment. Uh, there could be an argument that's made that says, you know, keeping and retaining Section Fifty A. Um, you know that 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 in some regards, you know, shows that the, the, there's still some element of fragmentation. So I think I think there's an argument to be made. I think the counter argument is the one that that, that I've just mentioned that, that that racial equality groups, those most affected by racial hatred, uh, and those that represent people who are most affected by racial hatred, would make the argument that that does not outweigh their concerns, uh, which are that there could be a weakening of protection for them. But I, I'm sorry, I'm struggling a bit here, Cabinet Secretary. Why not reflect these concerns in this brand new legislation that was going to be all encompassing? So um, we could look to potentially do that, and I'd be interested to explore ways that we could somehow you know, supplement 50A into the legislation or subsume it into the legislation. It's an argument um, that, 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 that um, I suppose we could look at. Uh, but at the moment, as I say, um, the argument from a number of the racial equality groups is to leave Section 50A as it is. If the argument, as I say, is to, to subsume that within the hate crime legislation, then let me take that away and give that further consideration. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Kamina. Um, uh, th thank you, uh, John. And uh, John's line of uh, questioning, uh, Cabinet Secretary, puts, um, uh, in my mind, a, a slightly different but, re but related question, which is that uh, I mean, th this isn't just consolidating legislation, is it? This is legislation which very significantly extends the scope of the criminal law in Scotland. And the extension of the scope of criminal law in Scotland can be seen by contrasting 50A with some of the provisions uh, in the bill that we've already uh, talked about in some depth uh, this morning. So the offence in Section 50A, the offence of racially aggravated harassment, um, uh, can be um, uh, prosecuted uh, if the uh, person uh, alleged to have committed it acts in a manner which is racially aggravated and causes or is intended to cause a person alarm or distress. And that sort of language, fear, alarm or distress, uh, is a common feature of sure. public order legislation and has been for decades. And yet it is another one of those common features of public order legislation in the present and in the past, which is to be omitted uh, from this uh, legislation here. So do you, can I put, put it as a, as a question? Do you accept that, you know, of course there is an element of consolidation about this bill, but this bill does much, much more than merely consolidating existing offences. It also extends the scope of the criminal law so that, for example, it will criminalise threatening and abusive behaviour where there is no evidence of either fear or alarm or distress actually being caused. Now, I'm not saying that it is inappropriate to criminalise that behaviour. I'm just asking you whether you accept that that is what the bill is seeking to do. And that is not a consolidation of existing offences. That's a significant extension of the scope of criminal law in Scotland. So the, the way I would look at it, 
is that it extends the protections that are afforded to some members of society from the from from being uh, the victims of hatred to those other groups in society that are often the victims of hatred too. So as I've often said, I think in the chamber, and I maybe have repeated already today, that I'm afforded certain protections because of my race, as are you, because of your race. But those protections are not afforded to people who are the victims of hatred because of their or stirring up of hatred because of their religion and indeed all the other characteristics that we know that the bill proposes. So I would look at it as the extension of protections um, as opposed to the way that you've characterised it. And what I'd also say, although you mentioned threatening, and I think you may say threatening and abusive, but threatening or abusive, and, you know, trust me, I know that one uh, for, for good reason, but also it is tied into intent. It's not just about threatening or abusive behaviour. You have to also be able to demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt that intent was there. So it's not criminalising. There was already a 2010 offence of threatening or abusive behaviour, and we can discuss that uh, if you wish. This is about also ensuring that there is intent behind the stirring up of offences. For new stirring up offences, for the racial stirring up offence, I accept there is intent and likelihood, uh, or sorry, or likelihood, um, as the case may be. So. Um, I think those are important contextual factors in that discussion. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right, Cabinet Secretary. There is a, a, an existing offence from uh, Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010 uh, of behaving in a threatening or abusive manner. But again, a critical ingredient of that offence is that uh, the behaviour which is criminalised is likely to cause a reasonable person to suffer fear or alarm. Um, and that is an element of the uh, um, offences which are there on the statute book now, but which are not um, in, in the bill uh, uh, that is in front of us uh, today. And so the conclusion that I draw from that uh, is that this is a bill which, doesn't, which does not merely consolidate existing offences. It does that, but it doesn't merely do that. It also significantly extends the scope of the criminal law by, as you put it, um, uh, offering protections to a range of protected character to a range of characteristics that are not currently protected by the scope of the criminal law. So it depends how you... I suppose I don't want to dance in the pen of a head here, uh, needle, uh, needle here, but look, you, you, you're, you're using the word significantly extends, and it depends on what context you mean significantly. So the racial standing up offence, and we know racial hatred is by far the greatest mm -hmm. uh, in terms of volume, uh, the, 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 the largest category of hatred. Now, the racial stirring up offence, even with its lower legal threshold, so it has a lower legal, I think we'd all have to accept a lower legal threshold than the other stirring up offences, has been prosecuted less than 10 times in the last seven or eight years in the Scottish courts. Now, if that is the effect of the racial stirring up offence, which has a lower legal threshold, then do we really think it's significantly extending uh, the scope in terms of frequency, volume, or effect that it will have on members of the public if that is extended to other protected characteristics. There's the, 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 there, I suppose, is a, is, is a question for discussion, debate. But what I would also say, in terms of fear and alarm, if the argument to me is that that affords a particular protection to individuals, I would say the inclusion of intent, and intent only for the new stirring up offences, probably provides an even more significant safeguard to people in relation to those new stirring up offences. Uh, I think Liam Kerr wants to ask some uh, wrap-up questions. And unless anybody else catches my eye, the, these will be the last questions, Cabinet Secretary. Liam. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, very briefly, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to go back to a question James Kelly put earlier about performance of plays. And it was j just something that's amusing in my mind. If I produce or record something in England uh, or Wales, uh, which is then... Uh, published or recorded or reproduced in Scotland, under the current bill, can I be convicted of an offence? And if so, how are you going to prosecute me? So are you talking about material that is... Uh, are you talking about under the Part 2 offence? Because if you're talking about under the, 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 the Part 2, the stirring up uh, offence, if that offence is committed in Scotland, so if the material, you know, if the leaflet that you're communicating or distributed was produced by the English Defence League, for example. Um, so it was produced in England, but was distributed up here in Scotland. Um, then the offence would still be taking place if that behaviour was threatening or abusive with the intent of stirring up religious hatred, for example. But I'd perhaps look to my colleague Philip Lamont if that is uh, his understanding as well. 
Well, I mean, it will all depend on the facts and circumstances, but it's possible there might be offences committed in both jurisdictions, and then the prosecution authorities would need to speak to each other. But it will depend exactly on the exact facts and circumstances of the behaviour that gives rise to the offence. Well, quite clearly, but in relation to James Kelly's question earlier on around plays, uh -huh. presumably I could, I, I could stage a play in England, or I could write a play in England, which is then staged in Scotland. It, it doesn't constitute any form of hate crime in England, but would constitute a hate crime in Scotland. Uh, would I then be prosecuted? And if so, how, if I never set foot in the jurisdiction? So, again, I'll let Philip come in on this, but the law talks about whether it was done with um, your consent or your connivance. Uh, there is also an, an element of neglect in there, but I'm happy to look at that again. So if it was done and it can be proven that it was done as the director with your consent, then there may well be a, a, a matter that the courts, oh, sorry, the prosecuting authorities would want to look at. Just, uh, just on that then, because um, it's just something that I've been musing on since, since James raised it. Uh, and perhaps we could speak more on this another time. Uh, but I, I wonder, has there been any conversation between the jurisdictions about how, about the interaction between the, the differing, uh, or what would be the differing legal systems, but how they, the, they would interplay? Well, I mean, this is an issue that, that, that Police Scotland uh, deal with on, on, on a more than regular basis, as you'd imagine, uh, kind of cross-border crime and where law may be different uh, in our jurisdiction, our separate legal system, and, and how law may be different in England and Wales. I haven't had a, a particular discussion with my, excuse me, UK government counterparts um, on this. Uh, in particular, we've been dealing with a variety of other issues, uh, but not, not on this issue because it is very much uh, an issue for um, the, the, the Scottish uh, legal system to, to, to deal with. But, um, you know, again, I don't know if officials have anything to update about conversations they may have, ha may have had with UK government officials, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, dealing with differences in law between England and, and, and Scotland is not something that's uncommon for Police Scotland to, to investigate. In England and Wales, they have stirring up hatred offences for three characteristics, but only one in Scotland. So therefore, the scenario that you um, are putting forward is true, but it already is the case and has been since stirring up religious hatred and stirring up um, hatred on the basis of sexual orientation was brought in in England and Wales in the 2000s. Yes, I understand that. I was just curious as to whether there had been conversations about an interplay between a new bill and what's in place elsewhere. However, uh, I'll move on. Um, Cameron Secretary, I want to ask you specifically, as I'm sure you're expecting, about the financial memorandum. Uh, I've seen several examples, I think probably all have since coming in here, of financial memorandums of bills which, no doubt inadvertently, uh, perhaps haven't accounted for all the uh, costs. Now, you will have seen reports today that the SCTS didn't see the final draft of the hate crime bill and the financial memorandum until they were published. And they say they were disappointed that it was not provided with sufficient opportunity to fully contribute. Can you tell me why was that? And were there any other groups who perhaps should have been in hindsight, consulted and had input on the financial memorandum, but perhaps did not? Well, I pre appreciate uh, Liam Kerr asking the question. I think it would be a reasonable question uh, to, to, to ask on the back of the letter. Uh, what I would do is point to a few things. Um, one, I, I would slightly disagree with the premise that there hasn't been a uh, consultation with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. There was a fair degree of consultation with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, uh, and they would have seen the intention the government had around the bill uh, way in advance of us even necessarily drafting legislation because of the consultations by Lord Brackadale or the review by Lord Brackadale, the consultation by the government, uh, but also through official engagement. So although they may not have seen the absolute final product with the I's dotted and, and the T's crossed, and it would be right that we would introduce that to Parliament and Parliament would see that first, um, they would have been very well aware of what the bill was proposing to do. On the receipt of that letter, and, and, and I have to say, uh, I was surprised at the, 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 the nature of, of, of that letter when it was received in, in, in the summertime, but when, on the receipt of that letter uh, and, and, and the concerns raised in it, my officials uh, made sure that they picked up the phone immediately to the Scottish Coach and Tribunal Service. I speak to them uh, 
every couple of weeks. Um, we're working through any concerns that they have around the implementation, but it's fair to say that their view, and of course, you're, I suspect you'll no doubt question the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service uh, during their evidence sessions, that, 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 that they would hopefully be able and be in a position that, to confirm that good, good progress uh, has been made in, in that regard. Just on that, in, when, so the letter came in in June, uh, and at that time the SCTS were saying, look, if the costs are significant, if they assess this and the, the costs they discover are significant, we are of the view that these could not be met from current budgets. So when you say that there were, were these meetings around that time to, to address these concerns, uh, what were the conclusions of that? I mean, what, what sure. if the bill is brought in? and the SCTS cannot meet the cost from current budgets. So a couple of things to say. I think from our further conversation since June, it's hopefully acted as a reassurance to the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service that they, perhaps the way that they were interpreting the bill and the additional costs that they think it might have required will hopefully we've been able to mitigate some of those concerns. But again, the committee would be free to, of course, ask question the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service about that. Uh, what I'd say on, on a bill, and again, you know, being a minister for eight years and taking numerous bills to this parliament, you know, financial memorandums will often need changed and tweaked as, as amendments, for example, are, are, are passed at stage two, for example. So we'll keep that under regular consideration on the broader point. You know, discussions around the Scottish Courts and Tribunals budgets are, are ongoing, as you'd expect. And just for a point of information, there was a, a meeting with the finance secretary, myself, Lord Advocate and Lord President recently to discuss the finances of the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service. So it's a matter that's kept under very regular consideration. Final question for me, Cabinet Secretary. One would have thought the other potential cost uh, will be around the policing of this. Uh, one can think of, for example, the, the cost of, presumably there will be a lot of training to be done uh, of officers, 17,000 odd officers, uh, for example. So Given what the SCTS has said, the obvious question is, were the police consulted uh, in a different way or in a similar way to the SCTS? Would they say the same thing uh, as the SCTS has said in, in their letter? Uh, and perhaps more importantly at this stage, what planning has been done with the police to ensure that not only can the police enforce this, but they are sufficiently resourced to take people away from the front line in order to be trained or whatever other costs are involved? Yeah, again, I think it's not an unreasonable question to ask. I'm just looking through the financial memorandum and there are uh, various uh, parts of that memorandum that talk about our uh, view from Police Scotland. And obviously, obviously we would take a view from Police um, Scotland and, and, and that's why uh, they're referencing the financial memorandum uh, throughout uh, the, 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 the FM, uh, the financial memorandum. And I think uh, the costs that we have in that memorandum are reflective of the conversations uh, that we have with Police Scotland. So in section, uh, paragraph 85, for example, uh, there is some discussion around the training element, sorry, 85, 86. Um, the, 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 there are some uh, discussions there, or some, some, some information there around the training uh, undertaken by officers in-house and that will have a notional cost. So that's our uh, that, that that's done with you know in conversation with Police Scotland. Um, I think the members maybe raised this previously, perhaps in the chamber. Other policing stakeholders, for example, like the Police Federation, would have a, a different view. They'll say, well, actually, there's more training required, and you know, the government needs to consider X, Y, Z. Now, in my recent conversation with the Police Federation on the bill. Um, the, and I'm hopefully not putting words in their mouth and they can very much speak for themselves, but, but, but moving to intent only, uh, stirring up offences, I think gave them some degree of reassurance around the training element. Now, I think they'll still continue to push uh, on that, but, but our conversations, of course, will continue. But long and short, yes, conversations with police have taken place. That's why they're referenced in the financial memorandum. And of course, they'll continue. What their views are on the bill and the financial memorandum, I'll leave for you to... To, to, to question Police Scotland, uh, no doubt, again, uh, if they're in front of this committee for their kind of more expansive thoughts on, on the bill more generally.
Cabinet Secretary, thank you very much for uh, the, your time uh, this morning. We've um, kept you here for a, a long time, but that's a reflection, I think, of the importance of the bill that you've put in front of, uh, of Parliament and the seriousness with which we uh, take it and will continue to take it during uh, our inquiry. We look forward to taking um, a whole range of evidence now from uh, stakeholders, and then we'll have you back uh, at the end of our uh, Stage 1 inquiry before we publish our report. But thank, thank you very you much for your time this morning. Um, we'll suspend for uh, five minutes to allow for changeover of witnesses and we'll reconvene at 11.50.
Okay, everyone, thank you very much. Welcome uh, back. And I welcome our second panel today. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Lord Brackadell uh, to the committee. Um, uh, Lord Brackadell, I understand you want to make a few opening remarks before we uh, ask you some questions. Uh, yes, thank you, convener. And I welcome this opportunity to uh, meet the committee. Uh, in my introductory remarks, I, I shall say a little about the format of the review uh, and some of the principles that underpinned uh, my approach. In 2017, Ms Ewing asked me to conduct the review, which I completed in 2018. I, I think it's important to bear in mind the difference between a review of this kind uh, and a project undertaken by the Scottish Law Commission. The Law Commission has the assistance of a draftsman and will typically prepare a draft bill. The review met, dealt more in terms of uh, points of principle and practice uh, and made recommendations which, if accepted, could be developed in uh, legislation. What I did do was to commission uh, Professors James Chalmers and uh, Fiona Leverick of the University of Glasgow uh, to prepare an academic report examining the underlying principles setting out the current law in Scotland and carrying out a comparative exercise uh, analysing the approach in other jurisdictions. Uh, and that comprehensive paper uh, was uh, issued along with my consultation paper. I also appointed uh, a reference group of people with relevant knowledge, experience and expertise from different backgrounds, including people with a practical criminal justice background uh, in the police, prosecution, defence, and sitting as a sheriff. Uh, in addition, I had members with a human rights background, a representative of Victim Support Scotland, uh, an academic, and a former Minister for Justice. And while I take full responsibility for the uh, terms of the report, uh, the assistance of that powerful group uh, was invaluable. The review gathered evidence uh, and consulted widely. I, I travelled from Lerwick to Dumfries to meet people. I had meetings with a number of members of the Scottish Parliament, some of which are on this committee. I spent a lot of time listening to representatives of stakeholder groups uh, and gained a good understanding uh, of the profound impact of hate crime on individuals and communities. Turning to the uh, underlying principles, I explored why hate crime legislation was necessary. From the evidence and the literature, it was clear that hate crime legislation, not on its own, but along with other interventions, including education and attitudinal shift, could contribute to addressing the mischief. And I ad identified a number of functions that make hate crime legislation necessary. It marks and undermines the additional harm which hate crime causes to the victim, other members of the protected group, uh, and wider society. It has an important symbolic function in sending out a message that such behaviour will not be tolerated. And there are practical benefits, including establishing a simple and easily understood scheme, achieving consistency in sentencing, and the maintenance of records to produce good quality annual statistics to inform future policy. And I consider these tests when considering what the best scheme uh, was. Finally, uh, when I was looking back at my report in anticipation uh, of coming here, I noticed that in the introduction I said, uh, my report is intended to enable Scottish politicians to debate the issues involved and to encourage public discourse. And to that extent, at least, 
uh, I may have had some success. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Lord uh, Brackadell, for that um, uh, introduction. Could I, could I just ask for you, if you could just outline where you think the principal differences are between the bill uh, and what you recommended the bill should do? Well, I think that um, the, the important aspect of this bill was to bring together a number of disparate uh, provisions. Uh, and that's why I think part one is enormously important. I, I think that the most significant um, aspect in which the government have not followed my recommendations in relation to part one um, is the uh, approach they've taken to gender. Uh, and I, mean, I can explore that in detail with you in due course if you wish, but I think that's the biggest in, in, in terms of part one. Um, yes, other members will want to explore uh, that with you in, so, in some detail in a, few, in a few moments. Can I just ask you about what you understand the relationship between part one and part two to be? Uh, in your report, I think it was paragraph 5.15, you said this, I hope I'm quoting accurately, I recognise that almost every case which could be prosecuted as a stirring up offence could also be prosecuted using a baseline offence and an aggravation. So wh why do we need both? Why do we need uh, stirring up offences in addition to uh, statutory aggravations? Because the stirring up offences are, are designed, in my view, to address the most egregious cases uh, where, generally speaking, the uh, attack is not on individual members of, or, of the group, but is on the group as a whole. Uh, and that, I think, is the difference. And that's why um, it, that, that's a relatively rare thing. And the uh, statistics in relation to race, racial, um, stirring up of racial hatred demonstrate that. Uh, and uh, I would expect that the number of cases in relation to the other uh, protected characteristics would be uh, relatively small as well, but that's because they would be uh, addressing the particularly egregious situation where the attack is on the group as a whole. So the stirring up offences are designed, in your view, to, um, to capture particularly egregious situations. Are they not designed? Uh, uh, what I'm trying to understand is whether these are particularly egregious situations which are already captured by part one, um, or whether there, there is something that, you know, it, it, what would we lose um, if we relied? You've said that um, part one, the statutory aggravation, is the, is the core method of prosecuting hate crime in Scotland. What would we lose if it were the only method? We would lose um, the ability for society to mark a particularly uh, insidious pro kind of offence addressed against the group as a whole. And um, I I'm fortified in that by the approach taken in other jurisdictions, in England and Wales, and in the jurisdictions that we looked at uh, abroad. So I, I think it's, a it's an issue of society saying, well, this particular approach against the group as a whole requires to be marked in a particular way. That's a very interesting way of putting it. Requires to be marked in a particular in a particular way. So that that, that suggests, and I don't want to put words in in, in your mouth, Lord Bracknell, but that suggests that part two isn't really about effective prosecution. It's about fair labelling. Uh, it's about um, uh, this Parliament legislating almost symbolically uh, to address itself to the particular egregiousness of uh, of, of hate crime, uh, and that would suggest that there's a bit of a sort of um, divide in this bill between what is going to be used on the ground in the way in which the police and the prosecuting authorities do their job, which is going to be re to rely overwhelmingly on part one, whereas so much of the political uh, argument uh, uh, with regard to this bill has been about the scope of, of, of part two. Would that be a fair characterization or am I missing something? Well, I think, I think one, one really only has to look at the, the examples of prosecutions under either the Public Order Act or Section 6 of the uh, Offensive Behaviour and uh, Football and, and Threatening Communications Act to see that there, that there are offences where persons are, uh, for example, um, in, in one case uh, under Section 6, where um, 
a person on Twitter stated that he hated Shia and Kurds and called for them to die like the Jews did at the hands of Nazi Germany. Now, it, it's that, it's the nature of, of attack on the group as a whole that it, it cries out there. And it seemed to me that, and, and I think this is, as I say, something that's done in, in every jurisdiction, is that th these particular kind of offences uh, call for a particular uh, way of dealing with them. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Rona Mackay will be next, and after Rona, it will be Annabel Ewing, please. Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, Lord Brackadale. Um, you made it clear in your opening statement uh, that, about why you believe hate crime legislation is necessary, and I think um, the whole Parliament has agreed on that. You um, suggest you, you told of an area that you, where the government hadn't taken forward your recommendations, um, but I wonder in broad terms, um, do you believe that the bill has, you know, um, demonstrated your um, your uh, most important um, points of the bill has has been implemented? Can you say that you're happy with the bill at this stage? Well, in, in broad terms, I think that they, they have implemented the main thrust of my recommendations, and um, I don't think it's for me to analyze particular sections in the way that they've done that. Uh, I think that's a matter for, for others. Uh, but in broad terms, they, they have adopted my recommendations mm -hmm. with, with some exceptions. Mm -hmm. And do you, see, do you see this as a consolidation and sort of strengthening of existing laws? And is, was that your aim to do that, to, to, to bring it together and, and clarify certain aspects of it? I think undoubtedly that consolidation was a, a hugely significant aspect of it. Um, the, the law on hate crime in Scotland has developed in a piecemeal way over decades, and bringing it all together in one, uh, one act, I think, is a useful thing to do uh, and should allow a better understanding and a clearer understanding of what the law is. You said in your opening statement that it had... Um spark debate and you know that was something that was, was quite evident were you surprised by the the amount of um debate if you like that it has uh, created in the media and elsewhere when i consulted um there i had a lot of responses and there was concern and a lot of concern raised about freedom of speech and i addressed these issues uh, and then um after my report was issued, the government conduct, conducted another consultation uh, and they had responses in relation to freedom of speech. But in neither of these consultations was there anything like the reaction which you've had in your consultation. Mm -hmm. And, I, I mean, there's a whole range of responses, as, as you know. Uh, but, 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 but certainly, the, 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 for, to take an example, the... Um, the likelihood uh, threshold didn't feature in the responses to my uh, consultation as a specific issue. It was freedom of speech generally that uh, it became an issue. But by the time it comes to your consultation, there's much, there's much more analysis, I think, by, um, for example, the legal bodies. There's also, I think, quite a bit of misunderstanding in some of the criticisms that have been made. And I think that, that underlines the importance of understanding that this, act, this bill should not be, in my view, uh, about a favor of, uh, a behavior which is offensive. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you. Annabel Ewing, please. Good afternoon, Lord Brackendale. Uh, and w welcome to the committee. Um, picking up on, on an issue you yourself referred to in your opening statement concerning the uh, characteristic of sex as far as aggravated offences are concerned, I don't know if you had the opportunity to look at the uh, session we just had with the Cabinet Secretary, and I asked him why he had not included uh, the characteristic of sex in the bill 
and he uh, gave a very fulsome answer and is obviously willing to listen. And the answer really, I think, it, uh, at its heart, uh, involved some concerns that have been raised that this express inclusion could in some way involve um, unintended negative consequences, particularly for women in abusive situations. But perhaps I could just ask Lord Brackadale himself why you proposed the express inclusion of the characteristic of sex in the bill. Well, I found in, a, in the evidence that there had been a, an increase in the harassment and abuse of women, both in the physical world and online. There had also been a cultural shift uh, in the sense that women were not prepared to tolerate the behaviour uh, that they might have put up with in the past. And I had regard to the requirements of uh, the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women uh, and also the requirements of the Istanbul Convention. And there was strong support in the consultation for uh, some provision in this area. Uh, and many of the consultees supported the introduction of a statutory aggravation. But uh, some of the organizations representing the interests of women, including in gender, Scottish Women's Aid, and Rape Crisis Scotland, were opposed to that approach uh, and favored instead taking more time to develop a standalone offense of misogyny. They advocated a participatory approach, taking, if necessary, years um, uh, 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 and they had a philosophical objection to the definition of hate crime that I was using, uh, which was that of Chakraborty and Garland, which underpins statutory aggravations. They wanted to uh, follow the definition advanced by Barbara Perry, which was that hate crime was designed to reaffirm precarious hierarchies uh, and characterize a given social order. They pointed to the lack of evidence of significant prosecutions in other jurisdictions, and they pointed to the example of New Jersey. They pointed, in their view, to a lack of uh, capacity of police and prosecutors to recognize and respond to gender-based hate crime. And they compared the approach in the Equality Act 2010, which they had felt had given rise to um, a highly generic approach, uh, which uh, spanned all protected characteristics and diminished the focus on the needs of particular groups. Now, I had a lot of respect for these organizations and I considered their arguments carefully but it seemed to me that there was no gap in the law that required to be filled by uh, an offense of harassment, misogynistic harassment. Uh, uh, because threatening or abusive behavior under Section 38 or communications under the Communications Act could have attached to them uh, a statutory aggravation. So I considered that it was not necessary to introduce a new offence, and introducing a new offence could cause confusion. Uh, it, it was also extremely difficult to pin down just what the precise definition of misogyny was, and I found that different groups indeed uh, had different understandings of, of what it meant. An aggravation would be in keeping with the general approach to the scheme I was suggesting, uh, and it, it met the requirements that I mentioned in my introductory uh, remarks of undermining uh, harm, sending a message, and the practical benefits. And I was also recommending a stirring up of hatred uh, extending to uh, gender or sex. Uh, 
And it's instructive to note that the Law Commission in England and Wales have very recently issued their consultation on hate crime. And they are proposing a number of radical measures. And we'll, when we come to discussing uh, stirring up offences, I could perhaps point to what their proposals are. But in relation to sex or gender, they have um, rejected the concept of misogyny. And they are recommending and consulting on their proposal, uh, which would be to add a protected characteristic of sex stroke gender. So uh, against that whole sort of background, uh, my own view was that th th this was an opportunity uh, to introduce a statutory aggravation. So that was a rather long answer. But, uh, yeah. I, I thank Lord Bacadil for his very comprehensive answer, very interesting in terms of the the rationale and the the, the methodological <laughs> approach that he has um, taken to the issue. I just wonder, he, Lord Brackendale said that in his view, issues to do with misogynistic harassment are arguably covered uh, in terms of current law. In terms of the lack of uh, sex as a characteristic being expressly mentioned on the face of the bill in terms of aggravations. Would that therefore represent any gap in protection in Lord Bracadale's view? Well, I was asked in my remit to consider whether additional protected characteristics should be added and both gender and age were specifically mentioned. So in terms of my remit, I required to explore that. And the evidence, in my, to my mind, led me to say that there should be a statutory aggravation in relation to sex or gender. OK, I, I think I'm reading that response. One last question, if I may convene a brief question. Um, the, the, the Lord Bradley, Brackaday will be aware that, in fact, the uh, intention of the Cabinet Secretary is to set up a working group on the issue of misogynistic harassment. And I, I assume that if uh, invited to, to give his views, Lord Brackaday would be willing to engage with that working group. It certainly, yes. If, if they wish to have me, I, I'm more than willing to speak to them. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Annabel. Um, Liam Kerr is next. Then, after Liam, it will be John Finney, please. Liam, uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Lord Brackadale. Uh, a, a very quick question that arises from Annabel. I mean, I'm going to stay on the same topic as uh, my friend Annabel Ewing. Um, just in your answers there, you talked a couple of times about sex, stroke, gender. Uh, just very briefly, do you use those terms interchangeably as meaning the same thing? Uh, or, or am I misunderstanding? Well, um, my remit was related to gender. And uh, so my report is in terms of gender. But the government have chosen to use sex. Um, and if they do introduce uh, a protected characteristic, they would use sex. Now, I, th I think that's for pretty technical reasons, but essentially, uh, I think we're talking about the same thing for, for the purposes of hate crime. Thank you. Uh, on the Annabel Ewing asked about the, the working group, the approach that the Scottish Government's decided to take, do you take a view, th this obviously differs from your conclusion in, in your report, do you take a view on the Scottish Government's approach? Is, it, is, is this a material deviation uh, from how you f saw this coming about? Do you, do you think it makes a material difference or actually is your view that you concluded this, the Scottish Government's taking it down a different route, but actually in the round, in the outcome, there will not be a material difference? Well, I, th I think in the face of these you know, quite formidable um, organisations representing women's interests, arguing for that approach, 
I can fully understand why the government would go down that road. Thank you. Uh, final question from me then. Do you take a view, uh, you might have heard the convener uh, allude to this question earlier on, do you take a view on the desirability of this sort of provision being brought in through primary legislation or secondary legislation? Or is there no material difference in your view? Well, I, th I think the, the, the comment that I would make is that um, by, by not including it in this primary legislation, there is perhaps a missed opportunity. Now, I think the women's groups will argue, well, that's so be it. They would rather wait for a number of years to get a different outcome. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, before we turn to John Finney, Rona Mackay has a brief supplementary in this area. Just very brief on, on that line of questioning. Um, would you agree that the, if sex was included as a characteristic as an aggravator, it would not exclusively protect women because it could be men or women? I, I, I do. I, I, I accept that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rona. John Finney, I think, wants to ask questions about um, statutory aggravation. John. Um, Thank you, Convener. Uh, good afternoon, Lord Barkadale, and thanks for your report that gets us to this point. Uh, I've just one very brief question, because I know my colleague, Fiona Robson, um, ha has, has a related question. Lord Barkadale, and this has been touched on earlier, but just perhaps for clarification, please. You recommended that statutory uh, aggravation sh um, should continue to be the core method of prosecuting hate crime. Does the bill, as it's presently configured, effectively provide for that approach, please? Well, in the sense that it um, has brought together in one place the existing statutory aggravations um, and an additional one which the government have introduced, uh, then I think it does. And, and I think that's the what I see as the importance of part one of this um, bill is that it will allow... Um, statutory aggravations to be, uh, as I do say, the core way in which uh, prosecutions are conducted. And um, what emerges is that although they can attach to any offence, they will most likely attach to offences such as assault or Section 38 or to the Communications Act uh, offence. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, thank you, John. That was quick. Um, uh, as you've mentioned, I think Shona Robson's also got questions in this area. So let's go to Shona uh, then. And after Shona, it will be James Kelly, please. Shona. Th thank you very much um, and good morning. Uh, just further on the, the statutory hate crime aggravation, um, where an offence is proven to have been aggravated by prejudice, the, the bill states that the court must make clear what difference the aggravation has made the sentence that's been imposed. Um, this is in line, as you, you know, with existing legislation, but um, appears to be contrary to your recommendation on this point. And I just wondered what your thinking was on that matter. Well, I, I thought that it was important that an aggravation is taken into account in sentencing and that an aggravation attaches to the previous convictions of the convicted person. Uh, I think it's important that the uh, court would state in sentencing that the offence was aggravated and that that should be recorded. And I, 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 I found evidence that the recording was uneven. And I think it's very important for statistical purposes that recording is, is well done. Uh, but uh, I found that when it came to the requirement to state the difference between what the sentence would have been uh, but for the uh, aggravation, that I was told by a number of practitioners and sheriffs that because sentencing is a complex exercise and takes a, into account a whole lot of considerations, for example, um, a reduction based on a guilty plea, uh, the contents of a social inquiry report, that um, it was really quite difficult to specify precisely what the difference was 
uh, between what the sentence would have been and what the sentence ended up being. And indeed, uh, the point was made to me by some that um, the, the, the victim of the crime might feel let down because there wasn't a sufficient difference expressed between the two. So, so that was the thinking that, that I thought that it was important that they're still recognised and noted and recorded and on the previous convictions, but to specify the difference um, w w was just too difficult in the context of, um, of, of sentencing. But, but, but I, I fully accept and understand the point that, that they, they, you make, that um, it, it can be measured, and that, that I can see the argument that it, it should be. But on balance, I came to the view that that, that particular aspect should not be continued. So, it, j just to be clear, it, it sounds as if what you're saying, Lord Brackadale, is that um, you, you're not opposed to the principle of it. It was more the kind of practical effect of how you would actually be able to extract that element from all the other elements that would be taken into account in, in sentencing. Is that, is that a fair summary? That, that's a fair summary, yes. OK, thank you for that. Um, just, just finally from me, is there anything else that you'd like to say about the approach uh, of statutory aggravations uh, in terms of uh, what's in the bill and in terms of your own recommendations and anything else you'd want to put on the record? I, I thought that the, the statutory aggravation scheme had worked effectively, that it, it, it makes for simplicity and consistency. It, um, prosecutors had told me that the use of aggravations was an effective means of prosecuting hate crime and that the annual statistics were building up as good quality statistics. Um, and for these reasons, I didn't make any radical uh, recommendations in relation to statutory aggravations. Um, I uh, suggested that, um, as I think you've alluded to earlier, that evincing malice and ill will might benefit from being re-expressed as demonstrating hostility. Uh, malice and ill will, evincing malice and ill will is well known to us as criminal lawyers over the years, but um, I think demonstrating hostility would be more readily understood um, generally. Uh, and um, I recommended that um, Protected persons should include not only those who are presumed to have a characteristic, but also uh, those who have an association with a particular identity. And that would include, for example, advocates who uh, advocate on behalf of protected groups. And that has been included in the, in the bill. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, um, Shona. Um, Lord Brackadell, we're now going to move to um, some questions about um, part two of the bill um, and the offences um, of stirring up hatred. Uh, and James Kelly is going to lead on that, followed by Rona, followed by me. So, James, first, please. Okay, uh, thank you, convener. Um, can I first of all uh, just deal with the issue of uh, freedom of expression, um, which has been the subject of some debate in terms of... Uh, how the bill seeks to protect freedom of expression in terms of potential prosecution on stirring up hatred offences. So what the, the, the current draft of the bill does is it protects on the basis of sex and religion. Um, there are others that have argued that that's too minimalist an approach and that the protections around freedom of expression should be extended in relation to more characteristics, and also that further defences should also be allowed. Just wondered what your view was on that. Well, any stirring up of hatred offence would require to meet the requirements of the um, Europe European Convention on Human Rights. And there are two approaches that you can use to protection of freedom of expression clauses. One is not to use them at all and to rely purely on um, the court 
applying the European Convention. If you are going to use them, then they should reflect the approach of the uh, European Convention and should in particular um, make clear where the line is drawn between uh, the offensive behaviour which is not being criminalised and uh, the type of behaviour that is being criminalised. So um, I myself think that the, the formula that was used in the Public Order Act and in Section 7 of the 2012 Act uh, had more strength about it than the formula that's used in relation to uh, religion in, in this bill. And um, I, I, I certainly would have expected, the, I, I recommended that, that there should be freedom of expression clauses, and I would have expected them to extend across all uh, protected characteristics, because one of the things I was trying to avoid was any kind of hierarchy of protected characteristics. Okay, that's very clear. Um, can I also ask about the issue with how plays and performances have been dealt with in the bill in relation to stirring up uh, hatred, which is in sections three and four? Um, again, as drafted, this has caused some anxiety amongst the, the performing groups and that they feel that potentially their ability to perform might be constrained. And also that's been reinforced by the, the Law Society who feel that the, 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 the proposals in this legislation go further than the Public Order Act uh, are more stringent and would threaten freedom of expression. Uh, have you got a view on that? I, I think that the, the Cabinet Secretary's amendment has a significant impact here because you're going to require intention to stir up hatred. What, what I find rather difficult to understand in the light of that restriction is that the performer would be uh, requiring to uh, behave in a threatening or abusive way and intend to stir up hatred. Uh, I don't understand how the concept of neglect on the part of the director fits easily with this. Um, and I noted that the cabinet secretary himself I think has, has, has understood that, but I do think that that requires to be revisited in the light of his amendment. Okay, I, think, I think that in relation to the existing public order defences, public order act defences, um, they, they become less significant if you're having to prove intention. Um, they, they, but, but they may, offences of that kind may still be required in relation to race because the double, uh, the, the two versions of the threshold are, are going to be retained there. But I think when you come to intention, uh, it, it, it becomes more difficult to argue that you need uh, a defence that you, you, you didn't know that you were... If you have to, if, you count, if the Crown have to prove intention, then it's difficult to, to demonstrate then that you didn't know uh, that uh, it, it might be um, stirring up hatred. Thank you. Uh, th 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 thank you, James. Can I just take you back, Lord Brackadell, to your um, uh, answer to James Kelly's first question about the free speech pr provisions in sections 11 and 12 of this bill? And you, you compared um, those provisions with um, section 7 of the now repealed Defensive Behaviour at Football Act 2012 and with um, section 29J of the Public Order Act. And both of those provisions um, uh, offered greater protection for freedom of speech than uh, sections in 11 and 12 of this bill do. I think that is what you said. I think you said that they were both stronger. Can I just ask you to clarify what you mean by that um, and ask you to reflect while you do so on what the Cabinet Secretary said earlier this morning about those uh, two provisions, 11 and 12, where he said that he's minded uh, to consider, he didn't commit himself to it, but he's minded to consider amendments that both broaden and deepen the protection of free speech uh, in those provisions. What he meant by that, he explained, was that um, uh, to broaden uh, the protection of free speech would mean that those protections would apply to all of the characteristics and not just to two of them, 
uh, and to deepen them would be uh, uh, to imply that um, the protection of free speech should not pertain only to discussion or criticism, uh, which is what the legislation says at the moment, but should extend also to the expression of antipathy, dislike, ridicule or insults, um, uh, which are words that are used uh, elsewhere on the statute book. Can I just get, get well, I, I invite you to, re to reflect on that. Yeah, yeah that, that would have been, that, that effectively was my recommendation, that the protection of freedom of speech would mirror just precisely what you've, what you've described. Obviously, the reference to abuse in, in, in some of the earlier ones would, would have to come out, but, but certainly, and, and I think that would be a, an expression in the bill of the kind of line we want to identify between offensive behaviour on one side and threatening and abusive behaviour with whatever other threshold there is. In, in, in the law of England and Wales, um, uh, the uh, extension of the stirring up offences to cover um, uh, religion uh, and sexual orientation uh, requires that the expression or behaviour is threatening, not threatening or abusive, but threatening, um, uh, do you think that it's appropriate that we extend the scope of the criminal law to criminalise not merely that which is threatening, but also that which is abusive uh, in these contexts? I think then it's quite important to, at this point, to refer to what the Law Commission are saying in England and Wales. They are um, proposing a quite radical change in relation to stirring up of hatred and to apply it across all of the characteristics, including race, and to have the same approach in relation to all. And what they are proposing to do is to keep the two thresholds of intention and likelihood, but where intention can be demonstrated, they intend to remove the earlier threshold of threatening and that any language, whether it's, threat, whether it's threatening or not, or whether it's abusive or not, that stirs up hatred and intends to stir up hatred uh, will constitute an offence. Where, on the other hand, the Crown will only be able to prove the likelihood threshold, the Law Commission are proposing to strengthen the threatening uh, threshold to threatening and abusive, so that it becomes, um, it becomes more difficult to, to, to prove it. So, so they're, they're sticking, to the two, um, sticking to the two thresholds, but they're going for threatening or abusive. In fact, they're adopting exactly the formula which I've suggested for the, um, for the likelihood one. So I think, I think the comparisons of England have to be understood in the light of this consultation. Um, that, 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 that's very helpful, but the, the core point remains, and the core point is that you, I mean, I, again, I really don't want to put words into your mouth, but I just want to be sure that the committee fully understands exactly the implications of what you're saying. That the, that your, your, your view is that the depth of the free speech protections in sections 11 and 12 should be extended to capture also antipathy, dislike, ridicule, and insults in addition to discussion or criticism. That was the force of your recommendation and, yes. you, and you haven't changed your mind. I haven't changed my mind. That's very helpful, thank you. I think Liam MacArthur also had a supplementary in this area and then it'll be uh, Rona. Thanks, Convener. Good afternoon, Lord Brackett. Could I also start by thanking you for um, your work in this area, but also your willingness to engage with those of us in the Parliament that have a, an interest in this area. Just on that, um, that, that issue of um, freedom of expression, the, the um, Cabinet Secretary earlier um, was uh, alluded to some concerns about uh, legal difficulties in terms of uh, in enhancing the, uh, the the protections around freedom of uh, of expression. He was a little bit more coy about what the nature of those legal difficulties were. I, I just wondered whether or not um, those were difficulties that, that you foresaw, um, or whether you were reasonably comfortable that, as the conveners um, explained, that this could be done relatively straightforwardly. Well, well, the test is really whether it, it, it reflects what's in the European Convention of Human Rights, in Article 17 and Article 10. And um, I think the formula that we've discussed does that. So, I, I, I mean, I, as you say, I don't know what the legal difficulties to which he was alluding 
are. That's fine. Thanks, Gray. Thank you very much. Uh, Rona. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, in an earlier answer to James Kelly, you said you tried to avoid um, a hierarchy of characteristics. Um, the, the bill retains the possibility um, of liability for stirring up racial hatred um, based on insulting behaviour. Can I ask if you think um, that does, in fact, create a hierarchy of characteristics, the fact that it's um, not in the bill? Well, I, I recommended the removal of the word insulting. And uh, I did so because I think I come back again to this line that I've talked about before of... Uh, the, the line which uh, divides offensive behaviour and abusive behaviour. And uh, insulting behaviour seems to me, on the face of it, to lie on the non-criminal side of that line. Uh, and that's why I, I, I thought it was inappropriate. In, in relation to a hierarchy, there's perhaps more difficulty now um, with, with retaining not only insulting in the stirring up of racial hatred, but also the uh, likelihood threshold. So uh, the, the, the position as of now is that there's a very significant difference between the approach to race and the approach to the other characteristics. If you took out insulting, then it would at least at that threshold level be similarity. Thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary gave us you know, quite um, stark figures of, of why that would justify possibly doing that? Would, would, you, would you say that would be mitigation of, of you know, um, allowing it to stand? I, um, when, when I looked into this issue, um, I, I asked the um, Crown Prosecution Service in England for some assistance because the word insulting has been deleted from Section 5 of the Public Order Act, which was a, a harassment offence. And the Crown Prosecution Service told us that they had been unable to find any case that could not be characterised as abusive as well as insulting, um, and, and took the view that from the perspective of the prosecution, the word insulting could safely be removed from uh, this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you um, very much, uh, Rona. Um, uh, just a couple of final questions, I think, from uh, me, Lord Bracknell, unless any other member of the committee wants to come back in, in which case, if they could indicate either on blue jeans or in the room, that would be very, very helpful. But just um, to get your view on a couple of the other differences between the way the stirring up offences are currently legislated for in the Public Order Act, uh, as amended, um, and the way in which they are proposed to be legislated for in, in, in this legislation, um, one of the ingredients uh, in the current uh, law, which is absent from the bill in front of us, is that uh, in Section 18 of the Public Order Act, um, uh, um, uh, no offence can be committed in terms of stirring up uh, racial hatred um, in a, a private dwelling uh, where there is no um, public order, as it were, element um, to, the, uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to the occurrence. Um, do, do you have a view as to whether that should be um, that should be omitted as it currently is from this bill, or whether we should include it? Well, I, I did not recommend the removal of the dwelling exception. I, I, I saw the exercise that I anticipated would be to um, rationalise the somewhat cumbersome structure, in my view, of the of the Public Order Act. So I did not recommend remand removal of the dwelling exception. No, no suggestion had been made to me that the existence of the dwelling exception had inhibited the use of the provision. Um, that said, I, I hear what the, law, the um, Cabinet Secretary said, and it's also instructive to note what the Law Commission is saying about this in England, which may lead to a change in the Public Order Act. Um, there are, they suggest that the, the aim of ensuring that the criminal law does not intrude on the purely uh, private matters, that this dwelling exception is, is poorly targeted because it would include a meeting in a large private house but would exclude a, a private conversation uh, 
in an office. Uh, and they also make the same point, I think, that the Cabinet Secretary was seeking to make, that you know, other incitement offences can be committed in, in a house. Uh, and they are now proposing to remove the dwelling exception. And, and, and you know, given your experience um, of the operation of, of criminal law, how, how, would you have any reflections on I mean, what, would, what, 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 that, what that suggestion from the Law Commission does is it moves what have formerly been understood to be public order offences into a purely private setting? Is that something about which you are relaxed? Is that something about which you think we should be relaxed or do you think we should be alert to some uh, da danger in that? I, I think that your concern is, is, uh, is well-founded and, and I think that this is something that you probably should do some further work on. I'm not sure what further work we can, we, we can well, do on it. Well, um, sh sh no, no, ask, sh ask, short, ask. short of asking questions <laughs> and putting down amendments, I think that's all we can do from here. <laughs> Um, uh, what, final question from me then, Lord Brackadale, if I may, and it's on the same subject, which is to say differences. Um, perhaps subtle differences of drafting, but perhaps differences of drafting which have you know, significant unintended consequences uh, between the construction of the um, stirring up offence in the current law and the construction of the offence in Section 3 of the Bill. Um, and it's um, the absence in the Bill of any provision equivalent to Section 18.5 of the Public Order Act, which provides that where someone does not intend to stir up hatred, they are not guilty of an offence if they were not aware that their behaviour might be threatening or abusive. As I say, there's no equivalent of that in the bill. Is, is that something which you think we should reflect on? Well, I, I think, but for the Cabinet Secretary's amendment, that would be a, an important issue. But I think that in relation to the protected characteristics which he's amending to require intention, then um, an, an, a defence which involves no intention is already not an offence. But, but for race. But, it, but maybe it needs to be looked at in terms of uh, stirring up racial hatred. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the offence of stirring up racial hatred in the law at the moment um, uh, it, it contains this uh, element, uh, which is not so much a defence, but a, a, you know, a, a, a part of the definition of the offence um, of, of the actus reus. Uh, there, it, no offence is committed um, if there's no intention uh, and if um, the individual was not aware uh, that the behaviour might be threatening, abusive or insulting. And yet, under the, the, under the, under the bill uh, as, as produced, um, that would become... Uh, an offence, or would appear to become uh, an, an offence. Yes, I, I think that that is something that, that requires to be addressed. Addressed by amending it. By amending it. Indeed. Right. Thank you very much. I don't think anybody, any other member of the committee has indicated that they wish to um, ask um, a question. So thank you very much, thank Lord Bracknell, not only for your time this morning, but for all of the work you've done over, over many years on this really important aspect of Scottish criminal law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on uh, directly, I think, because of um, uh, the clock, uh, colleagues, with the next item of our business this morning, which is consideration um, of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act uh, in relation to a United Kingdom statutory instrument proposal, um, namely the Jurisdiction, Judgments and Applicable Law Amendment, EU Exit Regulations uh, 2020. Um, uh, as the committee's uh, papers uh, note, uh, the Scottish Ministers believe that the changes in the proposed regulations are necessary to ensure the continued effective operation of the law and members of the committee are asked to consider this statutory instrument notification um, uh, and to consider whether we agree with the view of the Scottish Government uh, that it should consent to the relevant changes made by the United Kingdom Government. So can I ask if any members wish to comment? And I'll be advised if any members joining us online wish to comment. No, no member is indicating that they wish to comment. Are members content not to make any comments on this uh, instrument to Parliament? Members are content. Are members content to delegate the publication of a short factual report uh, to me 
which means to the clerks. Yes, good. Uh, that concludes our consideration of this uh, instrument. Thank you. And our final um, item of um, business this morning uh, is to receive a report on the meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing, which took place on the 17th uh, of uh, September and the 5th of October. Um, I don't know if John Finney, as convener of the subcommittee, wants to add anything to the written report that we have all read and absorbed. John? We can't hear you. Oh, now we can hear you. Thank you very much. Go, go again. Um, I'm content to leave it at that. Happy to take any questions, convener. Thank you very much, uh, John. Do any members of the uh, committee have questions for John Finney on this? You'd be glad to know, John, that nobody has got any uh, burning questions to ask you uh, uh, about this. Um, so that brings the, thank you very much, John, uh, that brings the public part of our meeting to a close. Our next meeting will be a week today on Tuesday, the 3rd of November, when we will continue to take stage one oral evidence on the hate crime and public order bill. I now close the public part uh, of this meeting and members are invited to move into private on Microsoft Teams. Thank you.